We're going to start with lesson, we're at lesson, as I say, 28 in the book, but six, we're looking at six, one to four tonight. Six, one to four, presuppositions for studying. We're going to remind ourselves of some of the ways that we have to approach the text after many lessons now that since we've spoken about that, we're going to talk about that again. We're going to do a little overview of chapter six and the seven seals. We'll get into a bit the first two, basically, or three seals tonight. We'll talk about that. So let's look at the text, the sacred text in Greek, and then we'll go to English, King James, and then we'll jump into the uh, analysis. Keidon oti inexe to arnion mien ecton epta sfragidon. Kikusa enos ecton tesaron zon legondos. Os phoni vrondis erhu. Ke idon, ke idu ipos levkos. Ke o kathimanos epafton echon toxon. Ke adothi aftos stephanos. Ke xilthi nekon ke ina nikisi. Ke oti inexet in sfragida tin defteran. Ikusa tu deftero zo legondos erhu. Ke exilzin alos ipos peros, ke to kathimeno epafton edothi afto lavin, tin erini nek disgis, ke ina alilos sfaxosi, ke edothi afto machira megali. And then in the English text. Let's see, we'll put that there. Let's see. There we go. And I saw, and I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, and as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and the power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and they that should kill one another, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. So we have some slight discrepancies. Just want to point out some slight discrepancies, not many, but some slight Let's start at the end uh, in terms of the English text. Here it says that they should kill one another, but actually the Greek has sfaxosi, alilus, to slay one another. And actually Elder Athanasius is going to point out that as a significant term, uh, which is much more than just to kill. And we'll get, we'll get to that in the interpretation. Uh, the also the slight difference in the text we see in one at the end of verse one, come and see. But in fact, it doesn't say see, but simply erhu, come. And I think that we have the same rendering uh, again at verse end of verse three. Again, it's erhu, which does not. Uh, say see, but simply to come. So not a huge issue, but it is a differentiation. Not sure why they would say and see, which is clearly not in the Greek text. Uh, in fact, uh, it reminds you of the gospel. Uh, and when the apostles said to the others, come and see, erko uh, is, is is the Greek. And so not sure why here they would add the phrase and see. All right, so we'll come back to that, of course, as we go through the text. Uh, but let's begin with our overview and some presuppositions. We're going to talk about, we're going to review some of the things we talked about a long time ago, uh, because now we're getting into areas that need, that we need to be uh, cognizant of the fact that how we interpret. All right, so we're going to go through that a bit, uh, talk about some of the presuppositions of proper interpretation. And we're also going to talk about how we approach the text, which is also very important. So you can see this is almost a, new, a second new beginning or second beginning 
uh, of our examination of the sacred text. And so we're, we're going we're to remind ourselves of some very important principles because, as you know, uh, most of you uh, in the uh, land of uh, heterodoxy that is the West, and we are a mi minority uh, in terms of numbers, that we're surrounded by very poor and heretical interpretations of the book of Revelation. And so it's incumbent upon us to be very careful and to, and to be, remember clearly uh, the, uh, the principles by which we interpret. All right. So I can see here, just going back to the, that is quite blurry for our crowdcasters. I wonder if it's that blurry for our YouTubers and all the rest. I'm sorry that's the case. Hopefully, at least you can hear me. Uh, and that's what's the most important thing. I don't know what else to say. Timothy, let me know if you can at least hear me. Everybody can hear me. I don't know what's going on with the uh, the, the the screen. Um, it's showing me I have a very good upload speed, so I have no idea why the screen is that blurry. It's not that important, but it is a little annoying. All right, let's go to some of our uh, presuppositions and, and remind ourselves how we're going to approach the sacred text, which is extremely important. So first and foremost, what we need to remember here is that we, all of us, have great need to understand that we have to become and have the stance of a disciple of Jesus Christ. We're not coming here to gather information. We're not coming here out of curiosity. We're not coming here to gather polemical texts against the heterodox or whatever else other reason you might be here tonight. We should be here for one reason, and that is to become a disciple, to have the spirit of discipleship. And so we're not here to hear a lecture, but to attend a very uh, specific lesson, uh, sitting at the feet of Elder Athanasius, who's sitting at the feet of the Holy Father's, who are interpreting and, of course, in communion with uh, the uh, gospel writers and our Lord Jesus Christ. And this, this is the true succession of the apostles, that is, those who live and have the spirit of the apostles and follow the Holy Fathers in everything. And so that's what we're attempting to do. That's why we're here and we're uh, take, making it bold, as it were, uh, to sit here before you and, and try to communicate the wisdom of Elder Athanasius and the Fathers. Uh, it is precisely because uh, we have need to come under and listen and be disciples of the disciples of the Lord and followers of the Holy Fathers. Our aim here is not simply to teach again and to listen and to learn about something, but actually to go further again and be disciples, which means to wake up our conscience hone our conscience to uh, grow in self-awareness, self-knowledge, which means that we're going to be both not just consoled by the text, a big part of the book of Revelation is consolation, and God gives it to us again and again throughout uh, the scriptures and in the book of Revelation, and not just to strengthen us, uh, but to revise previously uh, held positions which are mistaken and to to accept censure when we were not properly understanding and approaching the 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 holy scriptures and the fathers so we're constantly repenting returning reorienting and that is the path of salvation and so this is a part of that uh whole struggle uh so we're here to develop our inner world to go deeper, to experience not just uh, a wonderful, uh, enlightening lecture, but to have a rebirth and a change within. That's what everything in the church should be about, that regeneration, that healing of the inner man. Uh, we should develop that eschatological stance that we see in the book of Revelation and in the Apostle John. We should stand in that eschatological stance. What does that mean? That we're constantly looking beyond this world, beyond the passing vain uh, happenings around us, that, that we don't see, for instance, when we have something with our brother, we don't see our brother and identify him with the passions and sin, but we separate the two because we see 
who in our brother? The image of God. We see Christ. And so that's that's what it means to stand content, continually eschatologically, you know, looking to the world to come, looking to the, the, the new heaven and the new earth, looking to the second coming, looking to the, our day before the judgment seat, looking that we're, death is approaching. All of this is the stance of the true Christian. And so this book is extremely helpful in that very, very important stance that we must uh, acquire. And it is a, an inoculation spiritually against the very opposite spirit, which is in the world, which is a spirit of chiliasm, right? To, to make a heaven on earth, a utopia, which is being built by the uh, forerunners of Antichrist, literally before us, the transhumanists and the transgenderists and all these various distortions of the human person that are going on around us. They're trying to build a utopia. Uh, which is going to be a gross and 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 dis distortion and of course a nightmare, and so the Book of Revelation is going to keep us. It's going to help us if we're approaching it properly in an orthodox fashion to develop that eschatological stance, which is so important for the Christian to be. In other words, always focusing on the world to come and that with the judgment and the death is coming. Not forget death ever. Uh, so we we can't the end of the world. For us, is not some far off event, but it's coming literally before us, whether it be our last day on this earth or the actual second coming and the rise of Antichrist in the second coming. Uh, we have to establish this in our soul without becoming, uh, uh, you know, suppressing and 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 losing the natural optimism, uh, the the positive thoughts of a true Christian, because. He knows that Christ has overcome. He knows the end of history. We know what to expect. It is trial for a time, but then it is eternal uh, bliss with the Lord and 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 the, the the angels. So the joy that comes from being a disciple of Christ is not extinguished, and yet it's a joyful sorrow or a sorrowful joy, however you like to put it, harmolipi in Greek. In other words, there's a mixture constantly of that tension in this world, uh, and both coexist, and both are ex extremely necessary. One, again, as an inoculation against worldliness and the utopian delusion, and the other as uh, a constant focus on he who has overcome and the victory that he has given us. So it is not, uh, we do not, contrary to what many Orthodox uh, today might say, I mean, Orthodox, so-called Orthodox, they would say, uh, no, do not deal with that. Don't pay any attention to those things. It's none of our business. Uh, we shouldn't focus on the end. We shouldn't focus on the signs of the times. That is not what the Lord taught. It's not what the Holy Fathers taught. But it has to be done in an orthodox way and with great sobriety and great humility. And that is often not happening, unfortunately, among uh, those who... Uh, uh, the orthodox in, in, in contemporary uh, society. How much more for the heterodox? So we should not develop this idea that the Lord's uh, return will take place in a far off distant future. That is a bad idea and not an orthodox stance at all. We do not have that. It's come quickly, Lord Jesus. Does it not? That's how the book of Revelation ends. It's that it, it is imminent. He is near us and therefore the end of the world is near, as it says in Philippians 4, 5 to 6. Uh, this idea of, well, who cares? Who knows the end? Who knows when Christ will come? Don't bother with that. That is not the spirit of the gospel and the teachings of the Holy Fathers. Uh, history has, has a beginning. Well, history will have an end. There is an alpha and there is an omega. There is not, do not have this delusion that we are, this is a pagan idea. You know, we're going to be here forever on this fallen world. God forbid that we're here forever on this fallen, uh, uh, in this fallen state. Uh, among among death and, and corruption. That's not his will for us. Uh, when we begin to see the end of history as our goal, in other words, we're focused on the end of history, we keep the eschatological concern within us, and we're not careless, we're not carefree, who cares? That's not how an Orthodox Christian lives. Uh, and we will, we're not aiming any longer for worldly goals. Oh, we've got to get this new car. We've got to get the bigger house. We've got to get a better job. We've got to get this, this, and this. That's not our aim. 
right? That's not the aim of someone who's focusing on the second coming of Christ, on the a new heaven and new earth and the consummation. And when he departed and he gave the revelation to John, this is the beginning of the end. This is the this is already the end times. So every single Christian who's lived since the beginning is in the end times, and he has this eschatological stance, this expectation. So what's the what's the purpose again of prophecy? Prophecy serves to notify us about what will happen, will always happen in history. Not will happen once, but will always happen in history, and always with the aim of avoiding deception. You see that in the Gospel of the Lord, right? The signs of the times. Be aware. Why? Why does he talk about how the end will be? Why does he go on? There's a first week of Lent, we read the Gospels, uh, and they're all about the second coming. They're all about the days before the second coming, rather. So uh, why does he do that? If, because he loves us. Because he wants us not to fall into delusion and, and to fall away from him. And there will be great deception. And there is great deception in the world. Uh, and you have to be constantly vigilant. So this is good for us to remember the end times, because we're in the end times, not just, uh, we may not be in the end of the end times, but we are definitely in the end times. And as you'll see tonight again, with the circular interpretation, it's a constant present, not just a future event. We must not lose our vision uh, and our view of the horizon, right? It's what's coming up, what's on the horizon. We have to be constantly focused on that. So prophecy is meant to protect us from deception. It's also meant to console us. It's a great consolation in difficult times when you know uh, by the prophetic word what to expect. You know it more or less. And you know that the prophecies have and are becoming true and that this, the, the Lord uh, has said what will, what will take place and he will come back and all the rest, then you are encouraged. Ignorance of that brings about a despair or hopelessness when you look around at the world. And so that is not, that's a sign that we're missing something very basic to the Christian life. If we fall into despair, we fall into, into hopelessness, something's very wrong. We're focusing far too much on us, ourselves, this world, and not on the, the imminent end, how vain and quick and passing this all is, and the Lord is coming back. So the Lord in his great love for, for us prepares us, and he keeps us from this grave temptation of despair and hopelessness. He prepares us for that which is coming, to not lose heart, to not fall into despair, to not fall into delusion. So Revelation is par excellence a book of consolation, a book for the church, which comforts the people, and especially for those who are living through very dark and difficult days, as the church has lived through many times. Uh, the, the great persecution that happened, for instance, in the 20th century under the uh, atheist, communist, God-hating uh, regimes in the world, whether it be Russia or anywhere else, uh, this should not be seen as a particular exception to church history, but as something that's a uh, intense, yes, very intense, but normative uh, situation for Christians that were persecuted. As you'll see tonight, that is the normal state uh, of, the, of the Christian in the world. The two are inseparable, the good news of the gospel and the, res and the persecution that comes from the preaching of that good news. So why do we study? Again, why do we study? Why are we here tonight? Again, I want to drive it home. Not because we're here to gather up information. Not out of metaphysical curiosity. Not to try to interpret the book of Revelation so that we can figure out the historical events that are coming like the Protestants often do. And they assign, they interpret it and they assign it to all the physical events or the historical events that are happening right now. Russia and America and the war and all that. That's not why we're here. But it's to safeguard, safeguard ourselves and our families from being deceived and becoming the victims of falsehood and deception in this world. Elder Thanasius was talking in 1981 
when he was giving these lectures. Most of them happened in 1981. And he prophetically talks about in his one of his lectures here about what will happen in 2000. He said 2000 will come. This is 20 years before. And you will see a rise in deceivers and people who are going to frighten everyone into, uh, you know, uh, some kind of scheme and all the rest. We saw that in 2000. If you remember, there was a big scare in 2000 uh, with YK2. YK2, was that it? Yeah. YK2 and all the rest. Uh, we're going to see that, uh, I think, in our days as well with the coming economic collapse and that energy crisis and all that. You're going to see, again, a lot of hysteria. So do not succumb to that. Stay focused on uh, the, 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 the royal path of the Holy Fathers, neither to one extreme or another. He gives examples in his lecture tonight that we're following, and that is the Protestants in America, he says, and this is April uh, 14th, 1980. He's quoting from a newspaper that some Protestants in America believe that the beast with the ten horns, that's Revelation 17, is the ten countries of the European market. Well, at that time, there were ten countries in the European market, but now there are 27 countries in the European market. And so uh, he says he remembers that they were waiting uh, uh, for Greece to enter into the Union as the tenth member so they could say, well, there it is, the ten-horned beast. Uh, and consequently, the Antichrist is coming. Uh, and he says these are examples of the extreme delusion that can come about when people don't understand proper interpretation of the book of Revelation. So do not fall into those traps. Another Protestant pastor said in 1981, I think he's talking about somebody very well known because I don't think a lot of, in the 80s, I don't think a lot of Protestant material was reaching Greece, at least not in the degree it is today. In any case, somebody very well known doesn't mention the name. Uh, he says that they claim the Antichrist was 27 years old at that point. And of course, that would be that imminent that he would he would begin to reign, and and you know, and so the Antichrist was imminently going to reign in the world. Uh, who knows on what basis he made this uh, this claim? Uh, and he says we have to be very careful. Do not be curious, but be careful about these matters. The church has been cautious about Revelation since the beginning did not include the book in the liturgical church readings because it is widely abused by Satan and people who have a morbid curiosity. So contrary to those people who say, well, the church didn't include Revelation in the readings in the Vespers and the Feast uh, because it doubted it or it didn't want us to study it or anything like that. No, it didn't include it because interpretation is essential and very important in these epistles. And so there would be no real opportunity for that in the liturgical synaxis and there were not there would not be people who would be readily available and able to properly interpret uh, the book of revelation that doesn't mean the church did not interpret it. of course did we have the fathers who are interpreting including elder athanasius Another thing that the elder brings up that is important so we're coming here for our own spiritual benefit we're coming here to go further deeper obtain that eschatological stance, which is so important. But that's not enough. We can't keep it all for ourselves. And it's very important that you and uh, you and I and everyone who is struggling to listen to the word of God and the interpretation of the Holy Fathers not be indifferent to those around us. And so the elder admonishes those. And this is at a time that he is getting 1,000 to 1,500 people coming to these lectures in Larissa, Greece, in the, one of the largest churches there, uh, I think it was Aios uh, Archilios, if I'm not, Archilios, uh, a local saint, very large church in Larissa. They were filling it up, and there were literally people on the street outside listening uh, through the windows and uh, filling up, uh, uh, you know, every last corner of the church, 1,500 people listening to these lectures. And so he's admonishing, even then, admonishing the people, go out and bring somebody else with you and make sure, and do not be indifferent to your brother. Have them come and listen to the word of God. Of course, there was no internet back then. There was no, you know, all this technology today. So that was it. If you were going to listen to the word of God, you had to get up and go to the church and listen. And it is 
the best kind of philanthropy, he says, the best kind of charity that you can do today, far more important than other kinds of charity, because he says, apparently anyone is starving in Greece in 1981. And, uh, and that's true for the most part in most of the first world today. So if you're going to be philanthropic and love your brother, go out and bring them and have them participate in this study. It's a great charity uh, act that you'll be doing. Um, furthermore, it is not enough to use our little rational brains to figure out the Holy Scriptures and especially the book of Revelation. It's a presupposition that we have a struggling spirit which is making progress in the, in the attainment, the acquisition of the Holy Spirit, and the retainment of the Holy Spirit. These are two, two things. One, to acquire it, be the gift, and of course, be given to you in the mysteries. Another thing, to retain it, and that is to not uh, live a life and do things and say things and think things which are going to be contrary to the, to the uh, presence of the Holy Spirit. So a presupposition here that we're going to enter into the text is going to be this living in the Holy Spirit. And the elder says in this point, the following. It is the keeping of the commandments that makes one able to retain, obtain, and, and be a recipient of the Holy Spirit and retain the, the communion with the Holy Spirit. It is the purification of the heart. It is the constant contemplation of God. And here he says, contemplation or theoria, very uh, important term, misunderstood often in English. It's, it's uh, translated as contemplation, which usually means a reflection of the rational intellect. That's not what we mean here when we talk about theoria. And that is, he says it means, this is one way of trying to interpret, what does theoria mean, practically speaking? What do we need to do? He says it will, it will be an attempt to live in uh, all things uh, that we have been imparted and been taught to put into practice. Uh, when we contemplate, reflect on these things, uh, he says we become theoretical in the spiritual sense. What does that mean? A theoretical person is in patristic literature means a person, refers to a person who constantly contemplates the mysteries of God. And again, that's not a rational reflection. Oh, I wonder what it was like or uh, let's think about that. No, this is something that implies experience and communion. Uh, it, it, it presupposes the whole regiment of the church. Uh, and it's in an interior, uh, uh, let's say, noetic uh, dwelling before the throne of God, in the presence of God, in the Holy Spirit. It's that constant, uh, unending, uh, ceaseless presence of God in the heart. And that's exactly why the Hesychist life is the is the core of the Orthodox Church. And the monks who are praying the prayer night and day are at the core of the church because this is what uh, enables one to dwell constantly in the Holy Spirit and therefore be able to understand the Word of God. You see how the presuppositions are so important. And when we neglect them, when we're ignorant of them, when we set them aside, we doom ourselves to superficiality. We cannot become uh, be, be at peace with being a legalist and a moralist and doing the right things. We have to go deeper, brothers and sisters, and enter into the inner life of the man and dwell there and have theoria, have constant uh, dwell constantly in the presence of God before the throne of God. Furthermore, contrary to, again, this secularized, superficial Christianity and heterodox Christianity, which is oftentimes embraced, I was amazed uh, yesterday. I had two separate phone calls and emails essentially telling me the same problem in both, in two to totally different parishes, I won't go into the details, but essentially they were relaying to me that Orthodox Christians, Orthodox leaders in their churches were, were essentially blessing that which is not blessable, uh, whether it be uh, a, a lifestyle and a, a contrary to the gospel, which is condemned outright uh, within the book of Revelation and the gospels and the epistles, 
uh, or uh, uh, blessing, quote unquote. Uh, of course, it's impossible to do such. It's, it's more of a curse. Uh, Orthodox Christians departing, participating, and, and 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 going back and forth from Orthodox to heterodox, and back and forth, and and living a double life. And that was this was actually apparently being blessed by Orthodox uh, uh, leadership. And it's just it's just really phenomenal to me that uh, they that we we think we can do that. <laughs> we have we have no power whatsoever to do that. It is totally contrary. Uh, and we will only incur condemnation upon ourselves and upon those who listen to us. Uh, so this is the this is the great danger today is the secularization. And so Elder Athanasius is telling his people in 1981. Now we're we're what 41 years later, and we're in the heterodox West for the most of us. And here we are surrounded by the sea of not only secularization but heterodoxy. And he's saying, look, you need. And we need to go back to the spirit of the martyred church, the church of the catacombs, the church of the Russian Revolution, under the Russian Revolution, uh, the, the atheists, uh, the, the, the church that was has always been uh, the core of the church, which is uh, the eschatological stance, right? And the constant struggle for uh, obtaining holiness. And this is what he says. We must attempt to become vigilant and we must live this expectation of the last days. In the ancient church, the Christians lived as if the Lord was near. We do not care for worldly things. As the apostle writes, the Lord is near. Do not be concerned for worldly things. This is not me. This is not this. This phrase, do not be concerned, does not mean that you do not eat or drink, obviously or take care of the basic needs of one in this world. You don't build a home or you don't work, whatever it means. Do not forget your purpose and think that you will be permanent here. You're not residents here. You're pilgrims, you're passing through. It's very temporary. Do not build up castles here on this earth, but you need to build up and build as if, not you're living for thousands of years on this earth, but for a few years and leaving. The Lord is near. I should ask, Lord, when will you come? Lord, Lord, yes, come. Yes, I am coming quickly is the answer. And Revelation ends this way, doesn't it? Yes, I am coming soon. Come, Lord Jesus. So having said all that, reoriented ourselves again, coming back, making a new beginning here, let's go back in now into the sacred text and let's look over chapter 6. In chapter 6, this is, uh, we should remember, this is coming to the great apostle in exile. And not unlike the uh, appearance of the Lord to the apostle Paul on the way uh, to Damascus on the Lord's Day, the same thing happens to the apostle here on the Lord's Day. Uh He's trembling with great love at the appearance of the master. And he says, the Lord says to him, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I hold the church in my hand right to the seven churches of Asia Minor. So this is the context again. We were reminded of where we are. Uh, this does not refer again to any one particular bishop, but to every bishop in the church. And again, this, these things are schematic. So the number seven, for instance, seven, we're going to talk about seven seals tonight. That's a schisma, schematic number, and it represents the whole church. That's what the word number seven is supposed to imply. Uh, so it's a warning to the church for all ages. It's a concern for the entire church. Uh, we see that, again, the open door it means everything is open. The evangelist has been given uh, the message. Uh, it's been revealed to him. And it's being revealed in a progressive manner. And so now we're here in chapter 6, and we're seeing yet another layer that's being opened to us of this vision that the apostle had. It's constantly expanded, enlarged, and enriched. The scroll sealed with seven seals. Let's look at that now. 5-2, uh, it says there, who will open the scroll which was sealed with seven seals? In 5.2, we're introduced to these seven seals of the scroll, the loud voice coming to the apostle. And 
This sealed scroll is God's symbol for the future of the church. What is what is this sealed? So it's a, it's the church and the future of the church that's being revealed. Who will reveal this? How will we learn the future? And then the evangelist says, I wept. Remember, I wept, he said, because I said, who can be found? And of course, Jesus Christ, the slain lamb who is standing, was found. And the slain, meaning he was crucified, the standing, meaning he is resurrected. This refers to the incarnation, <clears throat> refers to his human nature, but also refers to the whole economy of salvation as we see in the resurrection ascension of, uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's read 6, 1 to 2 again, and then we'll comment on that. We'll go to the English only. 6, 1, and I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder. One of the four beasts saying, Come. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he sat on the he sat on him, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. So the main theme here is the unsealing of the sealed scroll. We've come now from 5.2 to 6.1, and we're, we're taking the this, this, this seal, and it's being uh, revealed to us. And the one performing the unsealing, of course, again, is the slain lamb, Jesus Christ, the Lord of history, who is being, who alone being omnip omniscient, God knows the future. He alone can open up the seal. We see three sets of seven visions, right? Three sets of seven visions. There are the there are other interrelated visions that are interjected as interludes, which serve to ref refresh uh, the the reader after the strong emotions of fear and awe aroused by the dreadful images described as the seals are opened. The first group of seven visions are the seven seals. The second group of seven visions are the seven trumpets. We'll get there. The third group of seven visions are the seven vials or bowls. So there's 21 enigmas in all. We're just now at the first of the first set, right? So we've got a long road ahead of us, and much of the mystery here is going to be begin to be, un, uh, to be unraveled and to be revealed. What is the relationship of time between these three sets of seven visions? Will, the, will one end and the other begin? Will the, other, uh, will the other one finish and the third set of seven begin after the second? How are we to interpret this? Well, you remember, and we're going to be reminded here by the elder of the way we interpret things. Very important in the book of Revelation. Many have fallen away because they do not have the proper interpretation, the proper tools and criteria for interpretation. You remember, we talked about it many, many lessons ago, the cyclical theory, cyclical theory of history. And they follow, the Orthodox interpreters follow the cyclical interpretation without overlooking the second theory uh, of interpretation, which is the linear or chronological, which we'll talk about next. So when the seven seals finish, they will have been loosened and materialized in history. Then they will begin to materialize again from the beginning. So it's cyclical, right? So it'll happen and then it'll happen again in history until these, these, these cyclical events, they recycle themselves, as it were. They continually finish and then start again from the beginning, contributing to a thickening of events. So what's the difference at the end? The difference at the end is not there's something new into heaven, but the intensity, the thickening as we approach the end of history. So people, we were talking, I forget what it was, someone was talking to me and they were they were afraid, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? I said, no, 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 it, there's nothing to be afraid of because nothing new is going to happen. It's, it's a question of intensity, not some novel uh, reality, because we've already been living in the end times for 2,000 years. The Apostle Paul says to Timothy, understand this also, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. In the last days. What are the last days again? Are they only the last of the last? No, they're the whole 2,000 years. The last days are not just the last seven years. In the last days, perilous times shall come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, 
without self-control, brutal despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the form of godliness, but denying its power. From such men, from such people, turn away. That is 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. What's interesting here, though, is that the last days are all the days that are coming immediately after Paul says this. He puts the future tense, and then he says, avoid these. Why did he say avoid these if that's only in the last time in the last days, right? No. Turn away from these people means I'm talking about now. The last days are now and going forward until the second coming of Christ. So, obviously, Paul and Timothy are not going to live for the second coming, right? So, the state of the last days is the state of every Christian from the beginning. However, we can say that there's the last days of the last days. And in that sense, that is the return before the return of Christ. There is an historical moment in which things will thicken to such a degree that there will be that which is necessary, that which will precede the coming of Christ, the second coming. Uh, it's a progressive thickening, right? It's over time we get deeper and deeper and there's a falling away, and it takes time. It's a process. For all of you, or all of those people out there who think that whether we're talking about salvation or damnation, whether we're talking about going close to Christ or falling away from Christ, that it is a split-second moment, a decision, and then never changes again. Here is a witness against all of that. Whether you're in, in the book of Revelation, it talks about the holier, the holy getting holier, and the, those who are unrighteous getting more unrighteous there is a process to drawing close to christ and there's a process of falling away from christ and it takes time so all for all of us today who think oh the problem is that since the 1950s america's falling away no 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 the problem is oh the the, the 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 biden administration the problem is the trump administration the problem is the last the cold war the problem is no these are all superficial the problem is that this goes back a long time. It's a fallen away that's been going on. It's a mystery of iniquity going back a thousand years. And it's been developing and, and getting more and more uh, distorted and, and, and farther away from the will of God uh, as time goes on. And even that is a cyclical uh, process. And even that has a pendulum swing in the West. It's not a it's not a straight line, but there's 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 a drawing close and going further away, uh, and there are those who are able to get out of that whole uh, uh, cycle uh, and 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 endless loop, and they find their way the third way uh, back to Christ. But now I'm getting off on a tangent. When the Apostle Paul talks about all these states of spiritual being right we talked we saw here unthankful and holy unloving and all the rest do not have the idea that he's talking about only those who are opposed to christ the atheist uh whatever it is the the super woke uh, you know insane of our day no no he's talking about christians he's talking about christians well former christians right people who were christians and who've fallen away the context is the falling away of Christians. They become self-loving, greedy, haughty, proud, arrogant, disobedient, right? Uh, and it's not just in the time of the end, but this has been going on from the beginning, right? Read the two epistles of St. John. Read the epistle of the apostle Jude. See how many Christians extended uh, existed whom the brother of, of, of God, Jude, calls waterless clouds he's talking about christians he calls them many decor decorous ad adjectives that do not complement them at all and so such types always existed and they were christian they were christian so when do these conditions begin they begin the moment the prophecy is spoken 
This is precisely why he says from the from them, turn away. So it's then and now, right? It's both and. It's always both and. Always both and, brothers and sisters. It's not one or the other. And almost always. So it will begin the age in which we live, and you will be repeated with every generation, this reality. This is clearly the cyclical, the circular, right? That's what's going on here. Listen to what uh, the apostle uh, says as well in 1 John. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. And therefore, we know that it is the last hour. What is it? Is the Antichrist has come and there are many Antichrists, he will come and there are many Antichrists that have come? What, which is it, the Apostle John? It's both. It's both. They've come, they're coming, and there will be a final Antichrist who will come. There are many forerunners. And all this began with the ascension into heaven of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Antichrist existed. Antichrist exists today. Antichrist will exist tomorrow. And there will be one final Antichrist. This is clear. So again, pointing to the cyclic, cyclic understanding, right? Uh, so, and that also is what we say about our own salvation. Don't we? We say, I, I was saved. I'm being saved. And I will be saved. That is the reality. That reflects the reality of our life in Christ. It reflects the reality of the world. It reflects the reality of those falling away. It reflects that this is a constant. Repentance is a constant. It's not once I repented and now I'm fine. No, I'm repenting continually. Why? Because the return is endless because God is endless. So there's never a time I can sit back and say, I've arrived. If you have arrived, you are lost. If that's what you think. I've arrived. I'm a Christian. I've got everything all taken care of. You know, I go to church, I do my thing. I, I'm expecting salvation, like a payment. You have been lost. There's, you're, you're not watchful. You're not prayerful. You're not, that's not the state, the eschatological stance of a true Christian. Now, let's talk about the linear method, the linear method, the chronological method, which in which the interpretation of these events occurs in an orderly fashion, one after another. And this is useful, but it's not always applicable. Can't always be applicable. Let's give one example of it being applicable. Uh, generally speaking, to interpret properly, you have to have both, and they're both applicable, both circular and the linear, right? But there is cases where you have the linear only, and you can tell by the, the, the context, usually. The Lord said the sun will be darkened and the moon, it says in Matthew 24, 29, Luke 13, 24. Well, that can't happen again and again and again. That's an event that's going to happen once at the end, right? So it'll only occur once. It will not be repeated. Therefore, here we have a clear uh, example that it has to be interpreted in a linear fashion. Well, somebody might say, well, this is very subjective. How do you know? How, how do you know that one's this and, and it's not, right? Well, because we're not making it up as we go. Because the Lord is present in his church and has inspired and taught his disciples, not just the 12, not just the 70, but all of his disciples throughout the church history. And he's present with them. The fact that so many in the heterodox papal and reformed Protestant world and others among the Orthodox who are falling away doubt the presence and the identifiable uh, continuation and presence of our Lord Jesus Christ in his church, especially among reformed Protestants, is a sign of alienation, and they can't come to believe that, yes, he's present, and therefore it's not just a subjective question, but it's the presence of God that makes things clear to us. So we have saints that have poured over and have been accepted and embraced by the church in their interpretation of the uh, book of Revelation. See, Andrew of Caesarea is the main one that's well-known and is followed, but there's Erethrus and there's others, Ikumon, Ikumenios, and others, and so we follow them. We follow them. We follow the Holy Fathers. And so we know in that sense, uh, to begin with, we're starting on the rock, the rock of the confession of the divinity, the theanthropic nature of Christ, and the rock of the life in Christ in the church. So we avoid these uh, kinds of interpretations that some people fall into and that they want to make revelation something unique uh, or interpreting apart 
uh, let's say it applies only to the Greek people, or it applies to the Russians, and it applies to the uh, to the West, it applies to whatever, right? And this is very uh, immediately we understand that this is not an interpretation that's patristic because this book is a universal book. It's talking about a universal reality. Uh, it's not going to solve any particular problems in particular times and nations, but it's referring to a universal constant experience. Now I'm going to quote. The elder here extensively because it's very valuable. Listen to what he says. The combination of the two methods that we shall follow can be presented with an elliptical line. Let us say that we have a mountain and around its base, a circle begins from one point. And we've talked about this 25 lessons ago or something. We're doing it again for many of our newcomers, but also to refresh our mind. And so when we go into chapter six, the seven and the seven seals, we're going to have that fresh in front of us, how we should interpret the scripture. He goes on, let us, the, let us say that we have a mountain and around its base, a circle begins from one point. At the base, a circle. The circle goes around and around so we can ascend the peak. Now, you know how a road is on a mountain. We do not go up abruptly. But we go around and around. After having gone two or three times around, we look down at the point from where we are and have ascended, and we can draw an elliptical, elliptical, elliptical line. After we reach the peak, we can look back down, and using the elliptical line from the point of our ascension, we can see the circles as we look down. These are the circles of the seven seals. These are the circles of the seven seals and seven trumpets and seven bowls or, or vials. And while they are circles, they simultaneously ascend as a spiral, giving us concentric circles. As we complete each circle, we continue our upward mobility until we climb all the way to the peak at the end times, the end of history. We've arrived at the end of history. We look back and we see that actually history has repeated itself, and now we're at the top, the second coming of Christ. So there's a constant re repetition of events, a progressive ascent towards the end, towards the peak, the end times. And thus we have a line. We have a circle and a line at the same time, circular and linear at the same time. This is the mixed method of the cyclical theory and the chronological theory of interpretation. Okay, right, very important. Let's move on and look uh, momentarily. We'll get to the actual text. Uh, so there is one point at which the fulfillment of revelation begins there are various viewpoints and i and we must uh say obviously it is not limited to the age of the sacred author nor is it limited to the end of history it begins from the moment of the sacred author and goes to the end of time it does not refer to one age but to all ages now there there are three into three elements three levels in in revelation according to saint uh, andrew of Caesarea. They refer to the historical, and this is also true of other scriptural uh, interpretation, the historical dimension, the moral ethical dimension, and the mystical or spiritual dimension. Again, we have the historical, the moral or ethic, and the mystical or spiritual. All three dimensions have to be present uh, and included in the interpretations, all right? They're all included. The historical dimension is... Uh, that which has already occurred is occurring or will occur in history as the seven historical churches in Asia Minor, the end times, the Antichrist, the second coming of Christ are all historical elements. Right? We're talking about history that's came and coming and will is is going on and will come. Uh, this whole time I've had that like that. I'm so sorry. We didn't do that. Um, but it's, what's important is you're listening to me anyway. So. So there's a danger when we remain in any one of these dimensions. And this happens among many who's fallen away from the proper interpretation. They only look at the history. They're only interested in the, in the with curiosity toward what, what war is coming and who's going to fight who, right? The, the, this is a distortion. Uh, all three dimensions, right? And it is... The scripture is 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 multifaceted and is, is teaching us many things. So the moral ethical aspect of our life is also being communicated here clearly in the book of Revelation and the mystical and spiritual 
uh, which goes and leads us to a deeper meaning of our life and of history. Uh, the message for man, right? That this personal relationship with our Lord and God and Savior, the communion that we're being led toward, not just a moral or an ethical or an historic, but now we're going into a spiritual encounter with the one who is. Uh, so in Revelation, it, it ends, as we said earlier, it ends with, uh, come, Lord Jesus, uh, the spirit and the bride say, come. And he who was listening says, uh, let he who hears the reading of the book, let him say, come, come. So uh, the Lord answers, yes, I, I am coming quickly. Amen. Yes, come, Lord Jesus, says the believer. So you see, this is a mystical spiritual dimension here uh, beyond ethics, beyond uh, externals, beyond history. We go into the, the, the meta-historical, right? After history, the, the eschatological. And here we now are talking proper, properly about theology. This is the realm of theology. The encounter, experience, the one who prays is the one who becomes a theologian, right? Because he's encountering and communing with and the, the, uh, the eschatological, that which is beyond time and space, which has come into time and space for our salvation. And he's participating in that eternal reality. That's when true theology happens. Not when you're sitting at the desk like I am here or any other person sitting at a desk and we're reading books and we're discussing it and we're debating it philosophically, ideologically. That's not theology. And there are many who want to say, I'm a theologian. Well, if, you're, if you are a theologian, you would know that theology is not one sitting and speculating. That is not theology as far from theology, theology is, again, the life beyond in Christ that has now entered into, into history, in the church. So we enter a point here where the soul will find its union with Christ. This is the spiritual, mystical dimension of Scripture. Threes, these three elements will constantly be encountered again and again here in the book of Revelation in, in chapter 6. Now let's go into chapter 6. We don't have much time. What are we at? Um, okay, we do have about 20 more minutes at least. I think we can do that. And we'll get done with this and maybe get into the next section as well. So we go back to 6.1. He says, I saw the Lamb opened one of the seven seals. Open one of the seven seals. So again, heaven is open. The door was open to the apostle. We see the living creatures again. We see the 24 presbyters. We see the throne of God, the slain lamb. And now we see the slain lamb opening the scroll, the seals of the scroll. Now the mysteries are being revealed. And I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as the familiar sound of th thunder, come, erhu, erhu. The four living creatures the liturgical spirits of God participate in the unraveling of this drama, of the execution of God's plan. For all those who say, oh, it doesn't matter. No, only Christ. Don't We don't need to deal with saints and angels and all that's nonsense. Just disregard it all. No, they play a role. And God ordained that they play a role in salvation. And he worked through people, and he gave them the, uh, the, 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 the grace and the power to forgive sins and to bind and loose and all of that. All of those poor, deluded Protestants who refused to understand that God ordained the participation of the apostles and the prophets and the, all of the holy ones throughout the ages to be a part of his economy. And he wants to honor them, and he wants them to be uh, honored by us, but it falls on deaf ears many times. And the first living creature is similar to a lion. We read elsewhere, 4-7. The roaring of a lion closely resembles the sound of, of thunder that we hear, like thunder, come. And one of the seven seals was opened. It was not just a random seal, but it was the first seal. Just like we say, the first of the day of the week of the Sabbath, right? First of the uh, day of the Sabbath. Well, this is the first seal, and the first seal is opened. Uh, and the living creature's voice was like a lion. And of course, it was a six-winged angel that we're talking about here. And this is the angelic 
uh, is being called, uh, this angelic being is that calls out, come. To whom is he saying this come? Who is he speaking to? Come. Come. He's saying it to the coming horseman. There's a horseman that's coming. And the first one is this white horse, right? And I saw and behold a white horse. And he was sitting. And he was, and he who was sitting on it had a bow and a crown was given to him. All right. So we see a white horse coming. He says, come to the white horse comes and it has a bow and a crown was given to him. This is a symbol of victory. White crown. This is victory. This is uh, the triumph of, of the kingdom. Uh, this is the gospel, right? We read elsewhere to the Bishop of Smyrna, you remember, he says, become faithful in a death and I will give you the crown of life. All right. So the crown here, Saint of Menio, Ecumenio says, the white horse, on the one hand, is a symbol of evangelization as a benevolent action towards men. The gospel. While the crown, on the other hand, hints of the dominion and of the victory. So the one seated on the white horse is the Christian gospel. It has been victorious. It has been preached. The gospel is the horse rider of the white horse. Come, it is the gospel that is coming into the world and being preached to the four corners of the world. St. Andrew says the following, it means the generation of the apostles who stretched out the preaching of the gospel like an arrow against the demons. Isn't that fantastic? Have you, have you ever thought about this? Have you understood and thought about the white horse being the victory over the demons, the victory over the devil, the victory over death, the gospel that has been preached and the victory of those preaching the apostles in their fight against the demons. They were fighting demons. They were just fighting flesh and blood, right? The apostle says that clearly, the opposing powers, so that the gospel could prevail over upon the earth. Here, as we see, we have a beautiful hope-bearing announcement, the gospel. It, it's the dawn of the gospel coming which is accomplished, accompanied by the grace, grace of God, by the power of Christ's resurrection, and it bears fruit. It bears fruit. It gives salvation to the world. In Mark 16, 19 to 20, we read the following. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven, sat down at the right hand of God, and they went forth and preached everywhere, while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by the signs and intended to it. This is the, 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 the horse is symbolizing this going out and this preaching. The first victory, they went out and they were conquerors. They were conquerors. And we saw already in the second century, according to St. Irenaeus, that the gospel had been preached to far ends of the world. Germany, Siberia, the east, the south, Egypt, Libya, in the middle uh, of the world, the church had spread everywhere already in the second century century. So again, we see the cyclical interpretation because obviously the gospel has not been preached once. It didn't. It wasn't just preached by the apostles, right? It, can, it was continually preached. So in every generation, there's a continual and a constant preaching until the very end of the world. So when it says that there will be a preaching and then the end, right, a preaching the gospel, it's not just one time or two times or five times. It'll be right up until the end. There will be a constant preaching of the gospel, including our generation, including the next generation. Until the very end, there will be a preaching of the gospel. Very important. An orthodox Christian preaching of the gospel. Because the gospel is the good news. And the good news comes through and in the church. Not through individuals. Not It's not an ideological message. It's a whole presence of God and life in Christ which is the church. It's all presupposed. So this is going on continually, and it's not just once and out. Uh, in 6.2, we read, he went on conquering and to conquer. So we see here the cyclical interpretation, right? It's not just he went out conquering, but and to conquer, and that shows the continuous nature of this. St. John the Evangelist, the apostle, says, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. 
the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, apostolic church's faith, the orthodox faith, is overcomes the world, and he overcomes the world. Uh, so I'm sorry, who, who, who is it that overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. But this belief, brothers and sisters, is not a belief in the sense only of a confession. Yes, he's the, he's the Messiah. The demons tremble and believe. It has to be also a trust. All right. So that's the two kinds of faith. Both kinds are necessary if we're going to talk about faith in the Son of God. If you believe in him, you have to trust him. And that trust means an experience of him. It means living in him like Apostle Paul did. That doesn't happen outside of the economy of salvation in the body of Christ, in the mysteries. Many things happen. Many people approach Christ. Many people seek to love him. But to put him on and to experience that and to and to truly come to know him and to trust him, that can't happen simply because we want it to. It can't happen simply because we heard about him and we expected him. We have to live it in our whole being, right? He came to put that we might put him on, right? In, in baptism and chrismation, in the communion. So belief in this sense that Jesus is the son of God, then you are a victor. And in, in, in you, the, death, the de death and sin is overcome. In you, the kingdom of God reigns. In you, he sits on your throne of your heart. And you also are a victor. So you are a horseman on a white horse when you are a part of this victory in the church and through the church and in Christ. Uh, you are coming out. You are victorious too. It's not some kind of abstract event. This is describing the spiritual reality of what's going on now in the world from the beginning uh, of, the, of the gospel to the end. It has a deeper meaning as well, beyond this meaning, even deeper. And that is, we read there, he came out being victorious and in order to win. And it refers to, there's a different interpretation, different, different, deeper meaning here. And that is two victories. There's two victories. The first is the spreading of the gospel which we just talked about, but there's a second meaning, and that is martyrdom. The second kind of victory is the martyrdom of Christians, those who remained faithful against the, those who were denying the gospel. In other words, the retention of the faith, this is what we were talking about, the retention of the faith, the trust in God unto death. This is the second kind of victory that's already been won, that's represented here by the horseman, the white horseman, the crown, is that the church gave its witness unto death and was victorious over the devil and sin and death. St. Andrew says very beautifully the following. The first victory is the return of the Gentiles to God, the preaching of the gospel to the ends of the world, to the church, the return of all to the household of faith, to the communion of the church. The second is the victory of the martyr, who is in the church and now goes out and is witness to Christ in the world and he's martyred, who voluntarily offers his body to tortures exiting this life victoriously. So it's both and. Both conversion and martyrdom, both are necessary if we're going to be victors. I'm going to keep going, even though this would be a natural place to stop because I want to try to cover more material. And we're going to go into 6.3 now. Let's look at 6.3. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see. Actually, the Greek is come, not see. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat thereupon to take peace from the earth. And that they should kill slay, actually the Greek says slay, one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Very interesting. What is all this about? First of all, the fiery red horse. Obviously, there's something really dynamic there that's being communicated. And it's the symbol of fire and blood and war. So we're talking here now about internal and external wars that are following upon the good news being preached, right? So this is very strong in the Greek. 
Let's go to the Greek actually. So I don't want to. I don't want to miss miss speak here. Let's look at the Greek again. Where is it? Ina alilus. Sorry, ina alilus sfaxosi. Sfaxosi. Fully, very strong. I mean, you don't. You don't. That term in modern Greek to get a sense of, I think, a similar usage here, is clearly something you use when you go to. Um, slaughter a pig or something right it's very brutal it's a slaughter it's a slain of uh, of the uh, of the other so here this is a viciousness an extraordinary bloodthirsty and vicious nature of the war okay it's not just war but it's a vicious war and it's something like a civil war right with civil wars are vicious because you end up killing brother killing another brother an uncle a uh, uh, others of your own flesh and blood you end up killing and this is terribly vicious and bloodthirsty and awful right and so uh, these kinds uh this kind of terror that comes to the world comes on the heels i'm going to say this several times of the preaching of the gospel and it will be something that will be global because we're always talking about something universal here it's not just one part of the world another part of the world so this is something that's a part of this whole existence from the first to the second coming of christ and it will be the revenge essentially of the flesh and the devil and the world against the preaching of the gospel it comes not because god wills it but because of the of the sin of the world in rejection and in in uh uh a rebellion against the uh, gospel. The gospel has been been translated, been uh, taken uh, in one form or another uh, throughout the world, and yet we still see, which is actually to be expected, a bloody and bloodthirsty world on its heels. And uh, this is not just, this is mainly, I would think, first and foremost, but it's not just this, pertaining to the persecution of the church and all, all, all of those who uh, represent the Prince of Peace in this world. The Lord said, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So this testimony, this martyria, is, 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 what, is what is really... Um, being taken to the world and then being rejected. So just because there's a preaching doesn't mean there's an acceptance. Just because there's a preaching doesn't mean there's an embrace. There's a faithfulness. So the fact that it will be preached to the to the four ends of the world, preached throughout the whole world, does not mean the whole world will actually embrace the gospel, obviously. And hearing this gospel, uh, now there's I think there is here some room for a differentiation in interpretation. Uh, indeed, the entire planet, one might say, has heard the gospel. In other words, we've heard about the gospel, right? You can go to all the ends of the world and you can say, I'm a Christian. And people will most, mostly say, oh, I know what that is. Or I think I know what it is, right? But hearing the gospel does not necessarily mean that they have heard it from the apostles, that they've heard it and seen it, that they've actually had an authentic presentation of the gospel so there's some room for differentiation there to hear is that what's really what the lord is talking about is it fulfilled already because the there's been translations to, in all the different languages is that a fulfillment is that actual is that actually been fulfilled now that that, that uh the, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world and test and as a testimony to all nations and then they will come is that been fulfilled because we have uh it translated into hundreds and hundreds of languages i think there's a there's room for a difference of interpretation here. Uh, St. John of Shanghai in San Francisco is quoted as saying uh, that the Orthodox gospel must be preached to the ends of the earth uh, before the end can come. Uh, and that that does that's, a, that's one way to look at this. Uh, there's another way which would say, well, you know, it's been translated, it's been it's been talked about, it's been heard of. People have heard about the gospel, they've heard that there's such a thing as Christ, there's such a thing as the church. I tend to think that's that's not sufficient to fulfill the gospel here. But 
I'm going to leave it open. Uh, what's important here is that uh, we, there's no room for excuses for any of us. If we've heard of the gospel, if we've, we've been introduced to us and we turn away and that, that witness to the ends of the earth will be a witness against those who turned away. Uh, the Lord himself gave the example of the fig tree, he says. When you see the fig tree bring forth tender leaves, you say summer is near. And when you see all these things taking place, you must know that the end is near. The Lord does not reveal the day and the hour. We do not exactly know when the end will come. He gives us a lot of signs. And he rebukes those in his time, the Pharisees, who knew how to understand the weather and the signs of those times, those signs for the physical world. They didn't understand. They didn't. They failed to look and to study the scriptures, to look for the signs of the coming of the Messiah. They ignored the signs of the first coming. And he rebukes those in his day who ignored those signs. And he rebukes us. 2,000 years later, toward the end of history, when we do not pay attention to the signs of his second coming. The Lord said to those then, and he's saying in a different way to us today, if we ignore the scriptures and the interpretation of the fathers, and one of the reasons why we're doing this class right now is that we are not guilty of ignoring all of that which has been given to us. Hypocrites, you know how to read the appearance of the sky. You say, in the morning the sky is red. The east is red. We will have good weather. At nighttime, you say the west is red, so we will have bad weather, etc. These are the hypocrites. You say tomorrow will rain, it will shine. Why don't you study history, gospel history, the economy of salvation in history? Why don't you study the scriptures to know when the end will come? The Lord called those who did not care to learn about the end times hypocrites. The end times began again with his first coming. So they were ignoring his admonitions uh, clearly. When he comes back, he asks rhetorically, will he find faith on the earth? And the answer, we know the answer, although he did not answer that question. We know the answer because this is not a question. This is a rhetorical question. And the answer is within the question. Clearly alluding to the fact that he will not find much faith on the earth when he comes back. He will not find it, except among the remnant that Apostle Paul talks about. And again, this shows that the gospel will be preached as a testimony, as a martyria, as a witness, but people will not all accept it. There will be people who do, and there will be many who do not. Because of this witness, people who reject the gospel will be without excuse. The Lord continues, you will hear about wars, he says in Matthew 24, 6. You will hear about wars. And it's interesting, isn't it? It's very, very ironic that since people will not accept the gospel, there will be no lasting peace. So on the heels of the gospel, there will be war. There will be war. It's very um, ironic, I guess, a natural consequence of the absence of the gospel will be the continuation of bloody wars. And there will also be rumors of wars, he says in the scriptures there. So you will hear of and see wars, but don't be afraid, he says, because these are just signs that it's coming, but it's not come yet, right? So this is preceding the end. These rumors of wars and wars are preceding and not the end. It's not the end. Those people who today, today look around the world and they say, we're in the end times. It's seven years. It's, we're, the Antichrist is coming any time now. No, that's not the case. That's not what the scripture says. not what the fathers say. It's not what the contemporary saints say. Rumors of wars and wars precede, but do not mark the immediate beginning of the end, right? So um, it's the perhaps beginning of the end, 
but not the end, right? Then you will be handed over to great affliction. Again, these things, everything we're talking about, it's cyclical, circular rather, right? So they, these things are applicable throughout the 2,000 years until today, until the end, or that whole period, and applicable in particular at the end of history. It's not just talking about the 12 apostles that he's speaking to. It's not just talking about the ancient church. It's not talking about the Turkish period. It's not talking about the, the Bolshevik period. Right? It's talking about everyone, all of us, all the faithful will be handed over to persecution and afflictions. All of us will have affliction, all of us, if we're Christians. This is what it means to have his name. Doesn't he say, for my namesake, you will be persecuted. Rejoice, he says. If, you, if they persecuted me, they persecute you, he says. So it's very clear this is the nature of being a Christian, right? The apostle says somewhere that that's what it means to live righteously in Jesus Christ, is to be persecuted. Because of this persecution, because of this falling away, many will be scandalized. Many will abandon the faith. Many Christians will compromise. They will leave the true faith because they will not be able to stand up against the hatred of the opposition. We see that today. We see that already. We're not even being persecuted. We see that there are those who we thought would stand and they have fallen, thought would stay and they are falling away. And this is the nature of the life of a Christian in the world. They will fall, he says, and they will renounce their Christian identity. To be scandalized means that they will stumble. That's what the word scandal implies. They will renounce their Christian baptism. They will begin to betray and hate each other. This is the nature. It's what happened in the Bolshevik Revolution, you had Christians walking away, becoming the living church, becoming uh, embracing uh, uh, heretical ideas like uh, like the uh, Sergianists, turning their back on the martyrs, turning their back on, on, on their fellow Christians, re uh, renouncing them, spying on them, any number of things to avoid persecution, to avoid the closing of the churches and all the rest. There was many, many tragic days but that's not just in the Bolshevik period. It's not just in the Turkish period. not just in the early church. It's going to be throughout church history. This is the nature of things. They will hate each other because of my name. So remember, from the very beginning, the first prophecy or there in, as a child still brought into the temple, a sign to be spoken against, the revealing of many hearts, many in Israel, they will not stand because of him. His presence in the world divides not because he divides but because people immediately have to make a choice do they embrace him or do they walk away from him and it says elsewhere even more directly brother will deliver up brother to death father his child the children rise up against parents and have been put to death and the elder says this is applying mainly to the flesh not to the spiritual but it could be but i think it's mainly brothers who are siblings born of the same mother having a common father they will betray each other these events described by the Lord can be summarized by the plain and simple imagery of the fiery red horse. Why are we talking about this? Why are we quoting the, the, the elder, uh, the, uh, the Lord? Because we're trying to flesh out what is this red horse? What is this fiery red horse all about? And this is summarized in this imagery of the fiery red horse that came out of a seal along with its rider who hold the large sword for the purpose of taking peace from the earth and introducing bloody warfare. This does not apply to any one particular event, but the whole state of things in the world for the Christian. It's a continual state. I want to stress that many times over. This is not once in a while. You're a Christian. You're persecuted. It's impossible to be in this fallen world with the mind of the world and all of the, the satanic suggestions and passions, and not to be persecuted. If you're not being persecuted, something's wrong. There's something wrong with us as Christians. It's a continual present, not once in a while, sometime in the past or sometime in the future. So this is this is one of the, the, the paradoxes of history, and the, it flows, though, and it makes perfect sense, and that is the following, that there is a white horse, 
that is continually emerging. And there is a red horse behind him that is continually emerging. The gospel is continually being pushed and preached and shared and lived. And the persecution is right on his heels, continually being lashed out and slain those slain one another and all the rest that always follows the gospel. Persecution always follows the gospel. The norm is hostility and persecution. They will always be coming out. There's never a time when these horses and this reality, the victory on the one hand, the persecution on the other, will not be coming in the world and being lived out by the church in the world. You'll see that this will happen again with the black horse. It'll come again with the yellow horse. It'll be a continual present, all right? Very important. It's a continual present, not something once in a while. These things are happening continuously. And with one important element that as we reach the end, as we said, what happens? There's a concentration of these events. They get more and more. That's the difference. And, you know, that's exactly what even some philosophers of our day have said. There's a reign of quantity today, right? Everything's more intense. There's more of the same. It's not it's na na Nature has not changed, but it seems as if it's changed because the quantity, the intensity has, has definitely increased, right? Exponentially. We see time seems to run faster. We see events seem to be harsher. We see the, the, this, is, this is not a, an illusion. This is reality. But it doesn't change the nature of things. We're not going to see something totally different. There's no new species <laughs> among the evolution, according to the evolutions, right? It's the same within that which God has created. But there will be more of everything, more floods, more wars, more diseases. We see that more bigger, more powerful in the end of the end. St. Andrew of Caesarea says, at the expansion of the gospel, the peace of the world was destroyed. Isn't that interesting? This, the gospel came and expanded, it was preached, and what happened? The peace of the world, false peace, the fallen peace, was destroyed. The gospel spreads, peace departs. Because the gospel throws it away? No, because the world and the worldly, the fallen, reject it. And so there's confrontation. The Lord said as much. He said, I did not come to bring peace upon the earth, but a sword. This is what he means. The great sword is the sim symbolism of war. It refers to the, the people who opposed Christ. Unbelievers use the sword against Christ, the church, Christians, his people, and Christ chooses not to restrict their will. For all of those who say Christ guides everything against people's will, that is a blasphemy. That's not true. He does not restrict the will of people. In fact, he uses in that new context all of it for the salvation of those who love him. So all of that becomes beneficial spiritually, even against the will of those who, who are against Christ. His presence removed peace from the world and the earth because people refused to repent. So the call of repentance went out. People refused to repent. And what happens? There's confrontation. The Pharisees fight against him. They call out for his death and his crucifixion. And the same goes for the church. The same reality for those who are in Christ that he lived on this earth. That you must be lifted up with Christ on the cross if you're going to be a part of this economy of salvation and all be drawn to the church, to Christ. That we're also lifted up on that, on that cross. If we're not lifted up on that cross with him, we're not a part of his salvific economy. We're not a part of his mission of the world. We're not a part of the salvation of the world. We're still uncrucified. We're still part of the world that does refuses to be crucified, right? Refuses to crucify the will and the passions and all the rest. St. Andrew again interprets, the sword was given, a great sword shows the all-wise allotment of God coming to test his faithful servants through temptation. So again, he uses it as a purification and as an in increase in grace and enlightenment for his people. The subject of persecution is interwoven with spreading the gospel in the pursuit of orthodox life in Christ. They're inseparable. And we must be conscious of this 
especially those who are beginning their life in Christ. People say, well, you know, I, now I have more temptation that I'm, I'm a catechumen. I have more temptation since I was baptized. Okay, that's a good sign. Don't worry. You're on a good path. What do you expect? It's going to get hard, but it's good. It's good. It's blessed. It's wonderful. And there's great, great peace in the midst of those that turmoil, if you're in Christ. St. Paul says that all, here it is, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. There are many people walking around saying that they're spiritual today. We have a lot of spiritual people today. Here's a test if you want to know if somebody's really spiritual. Are they being persecuted? If they're not being persecuted, if they're not suffering, if they're not in some way being rejected by the world, by the passions, by the devil, by the flesh, they're probably not really of God. They're not, they're not deep. They're not men that you want to follow. Unless, unless they're departed from this world and they're living in the desert and they're being persecuted by the demons and not by the world. That's one exception to that, according to the elder. And, of course, the demons attack men far, far more than men. Sometimes you can hide from men, but you can't hide from the demons. So that persecution is far more intense. I think I'll stop there. We've already gone over. I'll open it up to questions. I appreciate your attentiveness, and hopefully it's been very beneficial. We are so grateful to our elder and father, Athanasios, for his teaching tonight. Let's look at our questions. A lot of questions, as usual. You are attentive uh, to uh, the topic, I hope. A little bit of water, if you don't mind. Will heretics be damned, or will the people with major theological differences be saved if they are sincere with their walk with Christ? Well, you know, I feel like we got to unpack some of the terminology in this question to really get to the heart of what, the, what we're talking about. Because it, it's very easy. I'm not saying that a person who asks this question is like this. I don't know, of course. I, how could I know? But it's very easy for these questions to be asked in a, uh, in a way which is still somewhat superficial, legalistic, moralistic. I don't know how to describe it, but something that doesn't get to the heart of the spiritual reality of salvation and damnation, all right? So to be a heretic, first of all, it, it, we're talking in throughout church history is someone usually that's in the church rises up with a, another gospel, the Judaizers, the Gnostics, the Arians, the Monophysites, the Iconoclasts, the, the various uh, heretics uh, uh, that, that departed from the church and rejected the church didn't listen to the church, all right? There's a variety of... So they were in the church. They listened not to the voice of God in the church. They rejected the gospel. They created their own. They chose a portion of it against the whole. And they were uh, brought called to repentance by the church. The church, they did not repent. And the church says, you are anathema, anathema. What does that mean? We lift you up to God and he, to, we leave him, we leave you entirely to his judgment you are no longer in the house of faith. You are no longer part of the body of Christ unless you repent and come and teach as Christ taught, as the apostles taught. So that's, strictly speaking, a heretic, somebody who's in and rejects, right? Those also outside in those heterodox confessions, those heretical confessions who live their life there are also, strictly speaking, in terms of what they teach, heretical or heretics. But because they did not grow up, they did not have anything to do with the church for the most part, and they've inherited or they've understood this this from, for the most part, from their their community, their leaders. It's there can be a differentiation slightly to how pastorally the church deals with them and understands them. So we don't refer to them as heretics, but as heterodox. But essentially, it's the same thing. Heterodox would be another opinion or teaching or another glory or not the glory of Christ. So essentially we have an alienation, whether it be someone who's in the church rejects and walks away or someone who was never in the church, but has adopted that which is not of the church and not of Christ and not the gospel and not the truth. They're still in this uh, outside of communion. They're still far from the, the, uh, 
the life in Christ in the church, and they don't have the orthodox faith. They don't profess. They don't. They haven't submitted themselves in the in, to Christ in the church, and so their situation spiritually uh, is not all that different than those who walked away. However, obviously, if we can understand, there's there's so called what Elder Athena, or Elder Saint Paisus would say is there's elephantika in Greek, which basically is. Uh, you know, poorly translated is extenuating circumstances, right? Or there's 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 aspects of of history and their reality that that it, that means that there will be great uh, understanding, let's say, on the part. And these are all human terms trying to describe the stance that we understand God has uh, and they would have uh, w with regard to God and relation with God. So obviously, there's not the culpability, let's say, of those who walked away. There's not, the implications are not the same, but they're still outside of the body of Christ. They're still outside of the grace of the mysteries. And that is what's so tragic. So, uh, so going back to what it means to be saved, to be saved is to come into communion, to be in union with Christ. It's to be restored to the life of the Holy Trinity, communion with the Holy Trinity, right? Through Christ. It's to, it's to dwell now in the kingdom of God that's come through the church, all of them, and through the mysteries. It's to be in communion, right? So the communion has its presuppositions, and one of it is that we embrace the Orthodox faith. We're not teaching falsehood. We're not about God. We're not, we're, we're, the spirit of truth dwells in us, teaches us, and guides us, and we don't teach falsehood. That's a sign that we're in communion with God. So that's what it means to be saved. It's to be saved from sin and and death, and and to be in communion. Those things are those things go together. Uh, so, what does it mean to be lost? Well, it's, to be lost is is to to not be healed, to not be in the process of being healed. It's not to be in communion. You're you're on your own. You're cut off. You're autonomous. Uh, and so, healing, restoration, enlightenment, all of these things describe salvation, life in Christ, right? There are people who have embraced the Orthodox faith, many perhaps today, who do not avail themselves to the healing of the church. They're in the church. They've begun the process, perhaps. They've been given everything in the mysteries, and yet they have not actualized it. They've not embraced it. And they, uh, we, all of us who are like that, God help us, uh, are, are going to have a very tough time at, in terms of uh uh, how we stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We've been given it all, and we've not. We've either turned away from it, or we've 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 been indifferent indifferent to it, or whatever it might be. Um, so, how God will judge each one of us, of course, is beyond. We don't we have no. We have no say. We have no no position to speak about that. But we can, and we must speak about the nature and the identity of the church and the identity of Christ and the boundaries of the church, we can and must say, here is where you have communion with God, and here's where you're lost, and you're outside that communion. And that is not a mystery, but that's been revealed, and it's been taught, and it's been uh, given uh, by Christ and his and His saints throughout the ages. So uh, coming back to your question, will heretics be damned? Well, to be a heretic again is somebody who walked away from Christ, or to be someone who's outside of communion with Christ. So what does it mean to be saved in that context, right? I mean, obviously, they don't have that which means salvation. Doesn't doesn't they, they're, they're, the term heretic describes a, a state which is not in communion, we're not enlightened by God, not being not being guided, and the spirit of truth not animating that person. So there's a grave sickness that they're not being healed from because of pride uh, behind every heretic and every person who rejects the the church and the body of Christ is pride. And that is that makes us like unto the demons, not unto Christ, who is the extreme humility. So the question kind of answers itself. Uh, you go on, or will the people with major theological differences? So now you're saying that the, it's a question of theological differences, but it's not a question of theological differences. It's a question of communion, enlightenment, healing, right? He says, those with major theological differences will be saved if they're sincere with their walk with Christ. But th this is not, a, this is a different thing, right? This isn't what it means to be a heretic, right? Yeah. 
sincerity with a walk with Christ. Are they walking with Christ if they're heretics? No. The definition of a heretic is somebody who's walked away from Christ. Now, people can differ, say, well, I differ, I different, I have a different opinion of who a heretic is. But then again, the, the question is, well, what's your criteria? Who do you trust? Who tell who on what basis are you saying one is a heretic and one is not? And it's not a mystery if we follow the saints, if we follow the Holy Fathers, if we are in the communion of the church and we see the continuity of the communion of the church for 2,000 years, it's not something that's a mystery that no one can figure out who's in and who's out or who teaches orthodoxy and who does not. This is a question that comes out of the, of the multiplicity of confessions and denominations and the confusion and chaos of the Protestant world. That's a question that is, uh, sounds like it's coming from a Protestant context where you have many theological differences, but you all consider yourselves to be one in Christ. That's impossible, in fact, if you look at church history and the Orthodox faith, because to have a different theology means I have a different experience. To teach something different about Christ means that there's only, only if they're opposed and there are differences that, that are not in harmony, then one is correct and one is not. They can't both be correct. This is that's a relativism, right? That's a, that's very much of this age to think that we could all have theological differences but have the same experience. That's the Protestant ecclesiology that is anathema because it it, it does not reflect the experience of the church for two thousand years. Um, I don't know. I could go on and on, and I've actually written quite a bit about this in both of my books. So if you're interested in especially the the question of Protestant ecclesiology and ecumenism, read my little book called The Missionary Origins of Modern Ecumenism, and I talk about these, these issues in there uh, to a certain degree. Next question. Why are priests against teaching and talking about Revelation? You say the Revelations, but I think you mean the book of Revelation. I don't know. They'd have to ask those priests or whoever they are, uh, probably because they're afraid of extremism. They're afraid of people going off into all kinds of, uh, you know, extreme behavior, extreme ideas. I don't know. I don't think that's a good reason. I think we, we all the more we need to teach the Orthodox faith on this so people don't fall into um, delusion. I asked my priest and he said that we shouldn't waste time studying this because it might not happen. What might not happen? What? It is happening. What does he mean? It might not happen. It's happening because as we just explained tonight, the book of Revelation is about the, about the, time of the church from the first to the second coming. It's about our life in Christ. It's about our our whole history, our whole reality, our, our experience. It's not about something that will happen at the end. I mean, I think the problem here is he doesn't understand the Orthodox, he doesn't have the Orthodox understanding of the book of Revelation. And that's why it's so important that we go to the great elders and teachers of the faith and sit at their feet. I have asked both my priests many times and they refuse to talk about it. One said to speak of it would cause chaos and the other said it might not even happen. I don't understand that might not even happen is very problematic. What does that mean? The second coming is not going to happen. The, the Antichrist is not going to happen. He's already happened. I mean, we have many Antichrists, the, the Apostle John says. So it's happening. It's not, it won't happen. I, I, I think he's he's uh, very mis, 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 misled here, uh, what we're talking about here in the book of Revelation. The other thing is this, the, the fear there that, uh, that, your, the priest who says it might cause chaos. I mean, that's exactly why we have to teach and we have to bring the, the saints to bear so that the faithful are not consumed by that chaos and that, that, that that's no longer a characteristic of an Orthodox Christian, that there is order and understanding. And so I, I'm convinced, though, if these priests that, you're, that, that are guiding you actually read Elder Athanasius' texts, they would not have these opinions. I mean, I think it's just, I think it's just, tragic they don't they haven't been you know uh, introduced maybe to elder athanasius and and the and the depth and and patristic uh uh wisdom that he brings to us that brings us great consolation and uh, order so that's too bad johnny b has a question there are certain tribes uh people in south america who have never seen a white person they've never heard of christ or the gospel is it possible for them to be saved well, if that if that is true, which it seems to me increasingly that's not true, but let's let's just, I mean you're saying it is true, so I'm going to assume you're right that there are people who've never seen a white person and never heard of Christ or the gospel. Then I think the words of the Apostle Paul will be addressed to these people, and you you can go and look at that and 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 look it up online. I don't remember the actual passages right now, 
but he clearly talks about for those who have never heard the gospel, those who not have the law, actually he's talking about the law, uh, they have the law of their conscience and they'll be judged accordingly. So uh, if, if that's truly the case, never heard the gospel, then uh, Apostle Paul addresses, uh, according to the Apostle Paul, how they're going to be uh, judged or how and what criteria they're, they're going to uh, encounter God. And obviously that's in God's hands, right? That's not our concern. We, we should actually be there preaching the gospel, but unfortunately we're not. And um, that's a tragedy. Uh, we may have to give an, a, an account for that uh, as a collectively as why, why have we not taken the gospel and preached it? We're not spiritually prepared. Uh, we need a lot of work on ourselves, noetic prayer and all the rest. Uh, we have a book actually talks all about that as the basis for mission. So I think that's one of the reasons, but uh, uh, God will sort that out. I don't think we have to speculate. There's a lot of speculation in these kind of things. I think they're pretty much a waste of time. Um, next question. Orthodox Phronesis. I've purchased a very helpful three book set for learning Greek by Fotinis Shores. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know she had a three book set. That's wonderful. Would you happen to have any suggestions for going deeper into learning Greek for services? I need help pronouncing Yachma. Pronouncing Yachma. Okay. Uh, going deep in services means that you're pouring over the service text and you're in divine services. That's the best way. There's no other way around it. Um, I don't have any text to suggest to you except taking the very liturgical text themselves and, and pouring over them with a dictionary. Uh, the, you know, learning languages is an experience. It has to be, you have to encounter it, listen to it, hear it, read it. That's how you're going to learn. And there's no way around it. And there's a lot of long nights and days, especially if you're not living in a context where you're immersed in it, which is really what needs to happen for most people. Uh, but if you're talking about a, not the spoken language, but more or less just the uh, ancient Greek uh, that, that's in church, then you, you need to be in church. You need to be in church. You need to be pouring over the text, acquire the text. And uh, that's the that's the only thing I suggest in terms of liturgical services. I learned it in Greek because in Greece because I was going to church with a book for months and months. And I was just studying and studying and studying every every time, trying to simulate and participate in the divine services, praying to God that he might enlighten my darkness and that I might be able to participate in the divine liturgy. It took me a long time, a long time. Uh, Byzantine Ladybug, it is concerning uh, that Father Peter got those two reports from two different churches. I'm not sure what that means. I know that Father Peter said to choose a church that follows and adheres to the saints, but how do we determine this? What should we look out for? Almost like a checklist of criteria to eva evaluate if a church is on the narrow path or going into the weeds. Well, uh, there's a lot of criteria. I mean, it's not one thing, but uh, obviously they, they teach and preach the Orthodox faith. They're in communion with the Orthodox churches, a parish. Uh, they they honor the saints of our day. They, they 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 talk about, preach, and teach from the saints of our day. Uh, that means that they're following the saints and fathers of our day. So all of our contemporary saints, St. John of Shanghai in San Francisco, um, anybody who rejects, for instance, St. John of Shanghai in San Francisco as a saint, I would just stay away from them. Same goes with St. Nectarios, St. Justin Popovich, St. Paisios, St. Porfirios. Uh, so th that's a criteria that's, I think, immediately, you know, do you read, do you know, do you teach, do you have any experience of 20th century, 21st century saints uh, that, have, that have passed on Orthodox to St. Hilarion, Torsky, the new martyrs of Russia? Uh, that's a huge sign that somebody, they might be Orthodox in the sense that they, they're in the church, they're teaching, but they're not following the Holy Fathers. And so they're, they're in, um, entertaining or putting into practice things that the saints would never do. I'll give you, again, those those examples. Oh, and now you're referring to the two examples I gave during the, my lecture. Uh, yeah, so uh, those are great examples because we have essentially have people in the church who are teaching that which is clearly opposed to the consensus of the church, right? So, which is that there are boundaries and you can't go to heterodox services and heterodox churches and you can't, you can't, uh, tolerate 
clear uh, departure from the moral law. You can't have people who are embracing, uh, you know, openly embracing and, and living a lifestyle uh, which is opposed to the gospel, a sexual lifestyle which opposes the gospel, and that person just be a normal, uh, you know, everything's okay. Everything's fine, and he goes to church, and everybody sees him, and that, that's not possible. And 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 for someone to, to allow that and tolerate that and live with that, it's impossible for the church to do that. That's not healing him. It's certainly scandalizing everyone. And the, you yourself, as a as a person of authority in the church, you're uh, going to be falling away from God if you continue in that position. He's not going to be pleased with you. He's going to respond as he did to the strictly to the, some of the bishops of the seven churches. So these are all pretty obvious. I don't think I mean, these aren't these aren't hard to find. You can these are criteria that you can certainly see. Um, and the more you're in the church, the more you're going, you're going to learn. You're going to learn. You're going to experience something. You're going to take it to somebody you trust, some priest or bishop or whatever it is that you that you know is on the narrow path. Uh, that's a claim for their orthodoxy, that's uh, a confessor of the faith, whatever it is. And you say, well, this person is on the narrow path. I'll take that to them. You know, I had this experience and then I take it to them or to a monk or to an abbot or somebody who, you know, is in the corner, in the core of the church's life and has experience and criteria. You go to them and you say, well, I don't understand this. What is this? Uh, but orthodox faith, strictly uh, it's following the saints and 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 you know not innovating in any of the uh, of the life of the church so you know not uh, uh, creating and innovating with 20th century ideas about uh, the roles of uh, women in the church or or, or 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 the various sexual perversities in the church or the uh, the various uh, uh, practices of departing uh, you know i don't know innovating in liturgy the innovating in uh Catechism, ignoring uh, heretical teachings. There's a, a large variety of things that point to whether someone's on the narrow path. Uh, many Orthodox elders uh, say to side with Orthodox than heretics. Should so? Shouldn't we put our trust in Patriarch Kirill than his secular opposition in the current conflict? Well, I don't even know what conflict you're talking about. Are you talking about the war? What are you talking about? Uh, and what are the heretics that he's opposed to? This is a very uh, this question doesn't really give me any specifics. We're talking about some heretical teaching. You're talking about the war. Uh, so I don't know what you're talking about. Father Peter, you were once mentioned times we aren't uh, supposed to kneel or do prostrations. Can you please share when and why this is implemented? Are there ever exceptions like St. Ephraim's prayer? Well, it's in the ecumenical councils and the uh, First Ecumenical Council, and it's clear the fathers said and taught that the day of resurrection, which is Sunday, is not a day in which we um, uh, mourn. It's not a day in which we uh, uh, focus on anything but the resurrection. And so the prostrations, the kneeling is a sign of, uh, you know, of repentance, remorse, and, and all the rest. And so you cannot, it doesn't make sense liturgically in the public setting of the church on that day to, to do that. And so it's a clear teaching of the ecumenical council. And the church has always tried to implement that, although there are a lot of people who are ignorant of that. And there are people who only come to church once a week. So the spiritual fathers just kind of go along with it because they want them to express themselves in repentance and prayer and all the rest. Well, it's not the day. You've got to come to church more often, and you've got to do your prayers. And six days of the week is when we prostrate ourselves, when we do 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 all of that. Saturday's a day when we commemorate the reposed. Sunday's the day of the resurrection. We keep that day a day uh, that everything we're doing in that day is uh, is a celebration of the resurrection. I don't know what else to say. I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, are there exceptions? I mean, you know, I see some people actually prostrating on Sundays when they venerate the relics. What can I say? I would just say bow lowly, maybe to half the prostration. You need to, we need to signal that we're trying to be obedient to the mind of the church. We need to signal that we're we're not self-willed, right? So if it's Sunday and you want to venerate the relics and you really want to prostrate, okay, but I think it would be better and more consistent with obedience to the church is if you do a, a half prostration or a law, 
a deep bow. I mean, that's it's really basic stuff. It's not a, it's not a huge issue here, right? Just try to be obedient to the clear mind of the church on this question. Um, but it's not, you know, I'm not. If I was a parish priest and somebody started doing that, I would just say, hey, you know, it's Sunday. You don't have to. But I would. He's not going to make a big stink about it or something. Right? It's just it's a it's an important sign that we're being obedient to the church, that we're not innovating on these kind of things. Father, what is the closest English translation of the Septuagint? Um, that's a good question. There are several, and I don't remember the name right now in English. Uh, the one I use, the one I use in this course um, that I make use of, I should say, is uh, actually you can find it online. And I'm pretty sure that it is. Let me see if it's got an official name here. Um, the Hellenic Bible Society under the leadership of Dr. Michal has, has published the, the definitive edition of the Septuagint. So I, I use that. Greek Archdiocese has it online. Uh, I don't. I think the Septuagint for the church is one. I don't think there's a lot of. That's the actually what I'm talking about. That's the Greek version. The translation. You want the translation. I don't know. I don't know what the best translation in English, actually. I don't know, to tell you the truth. There are several, but I'm not a I'm not an authority on that. Because I actually, you know, I'm usually going to the Greek. Uh Metropolitan, the author said modern saints will decide the fate of people. If you are a saint, could you see yourself condemning the majority of Orthodox that are not as good forever? I don't know what you're talking about again, Trench. You got these questions that are kind of just open-ended. I don't know what you mean. I don't think he means they're sitting in condemnation of all these people. What do you mean? It's a very, very vague question. A little more specific question, and I'm happy to try to answer it. I often see icons of St. Paisius holding a red cross or a cross. Is he considered a martyr? No, he's not a martyr. St. Paisius is not a martyr. He's an ascetic. I'm not sure why he's holding a cross in the icon, except that he was a... An ascetic who confessed, the, I don't know. I don't know why the, Why would you have icons like that. I've seen icons, and I don't think he, he's having a cross, usually, in the icons that I see. What is Father Peter's opinion and understanding of Rasputin? Don't have much of one. There's a big debate in the Russian Orthodox world, uh, but most don't seem to be favorable, and I don't think most of the ecclesiastical men of his day were favorable to his orthodoxy or his... his uh, positive influence on the uh, on the uh, Holy Family. I know there are some who claim that he was and he's been libeled and slandered. I don't know. I don't know the answer to the truth. Uh, you better to talk to somebody who's really well versed in Russian Orthodox. So they got somebody, for instance, up at Holy Trinity Seminary who would be much better uh, to talk to on, you know, what's the truth around Rasputin? I, I, I tend to think that the ecclesiastical society of the day who would have known best were not super positive can you speak on the on the 10 lost tribes of israel please nope can't speak on that and also could you clarify the misunderstanding of the seven-year tribulation some are expecting like the rapture nope not time for that anna we'll deal with that in its time and so stick with me i'm not going to get into that especially not in a question it's a very extensive uh, examination but we will in due time, address that. We will in due time absolutely address the rapture in its place when we get there. Uh, it's not an orthodox teaching. That's the short answer. Can you clarify if the skins God put on Adam and Eve were metaphor for our bodies so we can't see the unseen realm or walk through walls like Jesus after conquering death? No, they are not metaphors. The skins God put on Adam and Eve uh, are representative of the fall and the flesh. Uh, they didn't, doesn't mean they, they they didn't have skin before, right? Uh, they were body and flesh before. And so if that's what you're implying, I'm not sure if that's what you're implying. But um, the fallen man doesn't no longer has the spiritual vision and communion, if that's what you mean. Yes, that's true. So they lost that communion, that intimacy, that that immediacy, that enlightenment. If that's what you mean, that they fell away from seeing uh, the, 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 the invisible spiritual realm, then certainly. 
uh, after the resurrection, I don't think Adam and Eve can be seen as equals to Jesus after the resurrection. The new Adam is not the same as the old Adam before the fall. All right. So before the fall, Adam was one thing is not the same as the new Adam after the resurrection. So I don't think Adam and Eve before the fall were, were walking uh, like Jesus after his resurrection. It's two different things. And he might have arrived at that over time if he was obedient and, and humble, but uh, they walked away from that. So we'll never know. But that the goal was um, far surpassed with the incarnation, I think. Even greater than what they had, would have arrived at is what Christ gave us in the incarnation. But that was, if they would have remained in communion, they would have, they would have eventually become solidified in that communion, uh, so to speak, anyway. I'm sure there are better ways to describe it, but that's that's one thing. All right, next question. Trench's clarification. Yes, about the war. Should Orthodox side with Kirill, which says that it is just? Um, I don't know. Sorry, I don't know, Trench. I'm not, I don't think any Orthodox tradition can ever be favor of war. And I don't think we, uh, this whole idea of a just war is a little problematic. I think the person to talk to or read on this might be Father Alexander Webster, who's written several books on this question and has a lot of patristic commentary. I'm not an expert on this, so I really don't know what to tell you. Um, and I don't, I don't, I don't think the Orthodox have to get behind when there's a war going on. I think we need to pray for peace, and our stance has to be one of great compunction. I mean, why don't you look to Metropolitan Onufri, who's in the middle of it all? What's his stance? That would probably be a good sign. Does he have the exact same stance as Kirill? It's a difficult situation. Can can one do the sign of the cross one time, then three times in general? Um, you can do the sign of the cross as many times as you want. I'm not sure what you mean. And to go to the and go to the navel and not the sternum, since that would not make a proper cross. Some say, but an upside down cross. Um, so the proper cross would be from the forehead to the, below the chest and to the left, uh, to the left and to the right, or however you want to say it, depending on how you're looking at the person. So uh, that's a proper cross. As far as how many times you make the sign of the cross, I don't think there's any kind of set rule. You have to make it three times or one time. It depends what you're doing. You make the sign of the cross, you make a bow many times in the church one time. Uh, you're talking about before, uh, when you venerate an icon, there's different traditions. The Russians, usually it's two, in my experience, and then one afterwards. You make the two bows and a cross, sign of the cross, you venerate, and then one afterwards. I suppose maybe there's places where you do three and two. I don't know. These things are pretty minor, and it depends on your parish, your the tradition you're coming from, and your spiritual father and all the rest. Not, not, not something universal on these particulars. Uh, can you tell me about the importance of the Orthodox phronema in interpreting the Psalms? Well, you need one. I'm not sure what, what I mean. In what sense? There's so many Psalms. I mean, wh how would I, how would I, of course, you have to have the Orthodox phronema if you're going to interpret the Psalms properly. But what about that? I'm not sure what you mean. I mean, read the patristic commentary. Read the Psalms in church, experience the prayer of the church in the Psalms, and you, little by little by little over much time, you're going to begin to understand and and live the spiritual life that the Psalms are are pointing us to. But it's very important to have the Orthodox Phronema in everything, and so interpreting Scripture, how much more? Uh, but I think you're going to acquire that through through the life of the church, the prayers of the church, and then reading the Holy Fathers. Are there many places where Father Rose may have had errors, perhaps in his views on Augustine, etc.? Thank you, Jacob. Well, I think that there's no one who doesn't have some error somewhere, right? I mean, we're not perfect uh, in everything we ever said or, or wrote, God forbid, if we thought that the saints that have errors, that, that the church never uh, rebuked, never encountered, and so the church never saw this as something that would obstruct their glorification. 
Um, they didn't stand against the church. They didn't resist the church, obviously. Uh, it was never addressed. Uh, it was never never dealt with. So, But the church later on said, you know, for instance, Blessed Augustine made some errors. And St. Photius says famously, we embrace the man. We don't embrace the errors. We set aside the errors. As far as Father Seraphim Rose having errors, um, nothing really jumps off the page or, you know, jumps jumps at me immediately and says, this is a glaring error. I think that it's hard to say his position on the question of reception of converts seems to be very consistent after his, uh, after his ordination. He baptized everyone. Uh, as far as other opinions, I think we have to read them in context. For instance, he was counter encountering and countering some extreme zealot positions on the right. And so in that context, he was talking about reception and what they were trying to do at the time. And I think you need to read that in context. And it doesn't mean that his uh, he would say the same thing today. So, um, but no major errors jump that I can remember right now. As far as Augustine, I don't know if he even went there. I don't think he examined a lot of the dogmatic questions that have been examined since his day. I think he embraced, again, he recognized there were errors and he embraced uh, the man and his piety. Uh, he did not go to Augustine for dogmatic theology. He didn't go to Augustine for his teaching on free will or grace or any of that. He went to him for his uh, his love and his compunction, how, how beautifully expresses all that in uh, his confessions. What is your view on Elder Euronymous of Egan and other holy people who were not part of the official church over issues such as the calendar change or surgeonism? Well, it's a lot of, you're unpacking a lot here, but... Uh, uh, you know, Elder Euronymous reposed in, in the 60s. I remember, I think 68, I can't remember the exact date, but 68, I think. And, you know, the reality in Greece in 68 was right in the cups, cusp of a big change in the uh, world of old calendarists and uh, the old calendarists in Greece. So in the 70s, you have an explosion of schisms. Uh, end of the 60s and 70s is, is where it really takes off. <clears throat> and so I'm not sure what Elder Euronymous would have said about all that. I think that he, he did not have the extreme positions of the Matthewites, for instance. He didn't embrace gracelessness in the mysteries of the church in the, uh, with the uh, new calendar. I, I think that he, he retained, um, as far as I know, I mean, I might be ignorant of some quotes or something people are going to present. But as far as I can see in his life, he avoided all of the uh, problematic positions that you find today among the more zealous old calendarists. And he he was embraced by many people in the Church of Greece. Um, I don't think he was an ideologically driven uh, old calendarist. So at that time, you can still find quotations from somebody like St. Philotheus Zervakos, where he says the old calendar Christians are Christians, they're Orthodox Christians, and he's he's basically pleading with the Church of Greece to to rectify the problem, and to embrace them and end the schism. And so I don't know if he would have said the same thing ten or twenty or thirty years later. I do think there was a pretty big sea change. I mean, there was a time in the late fifties, early sixties that they didn't have any more bishops uh, at all. At least many of the old calendars. Uh, had 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 uh, had lost all their bishops, and they had to go to the church abroad and basically begin again. Uh, so uh, the reality pre sixty eight and post or sixties and post sixties uh, does play a role in our proper understanding of uh, Elder Hieronymus. I think he's embraced by many as a holy man, if not a, a saint, uh, but certainly a very holy elder. And uh, I always love the story. The story of uh, Elder Euronymous, uh, when he comes over, I've said it many times, but he's really uh, made an impression on me. When he comes over from the old country in 1920, and he encounters modern Greece, and he says, where, where am I? Am I in an Orthodox country? Is this Christian people? Because he hears blasphemy and all this stuff. And so he had lived such an intense spiritual life in the old country in Constantinople, and before that in uh, Asia Minor and uh, uh, Cappadocia, uh, where he was from, I, uh, I forget the village. In any case, it was very in, in a very exalted life in the in the, in Asia Minor there, and um, 
he was uh he was of a high spiritual stature uh and friends with saints so thank god i don't know what else to tell you um i think that i i'm totally at one with uh, saint Zervo, uh, Flodio Zervakos, uh who said that the calendar change was a drastic error as expression of a very foreign spirit and mindset in terms of ecclesiology it needs to be repented of and there needs to be a return to unity and this is a ridiculous and awful schism that should never have happened uh, but i don't at the same time embrace the methodology that was embraced by the old calendars i don't think it's patristic i don't think they're following the saints they're not in follow and some of them are not following the saints explicitly such as uh, the abbot of Cesfig Menno, who rejects the sanctity of St. Paiso, St. Porfirio, St. Jacobus. Um, you know, that's a very bad sign. Uh, there's no discernment there. Um, the path of resistance to every heresy uh, is clear, uh, and it's not a mystery. And there are certain tools that we can use. Um, so, we need to follow that, follow the saints of our day. St. Paisio's ceased commemoration of Patriarch Athanagoras uh, in the 1960s, as did many Athenites. That's not the same as what happened later on with the Monastery of Esfigmenu. It's not the same as the Matthewites and the rest. So there's a, there's a really thin line there that I think is the patristic response in terms of the methodology of, of, of how to deal with all these problems in the 20th century. And there's been a you know, few that have walked it and many who have not. And so it's very delicate uh, and takes, I think it takes a lot. It took me a long time with a lot of research and speaking to a lot of people, traveling all over Greece and speaking with a variety of people. I went to Etna. I've been, I was with, I was in Jordanville back in the, in the nineties when they were in communion with uh, uh, some of the zealots, uh, the uh, Cyprianites. You know, I, I've talked to a lot, a lot. I went to, I went to, I met with, briefly with uh, Father Madelemon in 1997 in Boston, uh, when he told me immediately that I needed to depart from where I was, that these saints, these elders I was quoting were not true elders. You know, I, I've heard all this firsthand. And so it took me a long time though. And, and, and it's difficult to discern all that. Where exactly is the, the royal path? Ultimately, the church has to speak in council, and in council, they're going to lay down the boundaries in this very difficult 20th century that we just passed. Uh, I just checked the cover of St. Paisus' book that Father Peter translated, and the icon of St. Paisus is holding a cross. Oh, really? Because I don't have the new version. I have the old version. Well, he's not a martyr, so I'm not sure why they have the cross there. Usually, the cross is for martyrs. So, I, it's, it's you know, why he has the cross... They're, selling, they're trying to communicate something, but traditionally a martyr would have the cross. So I don't know. God doesn't interfere with our human will, so why pray for others, especially unbelievers? Uh, because love is very powerful, and I want to love my brethren. It's a good reason. What's the use, since he works in all our lives, to try and save us anyway? Because there's always a use for loving people. Christ rejoices. We're made holy because we love our neighbor. And love is not, there's no limit to what God can do when there's love. I think if we start loving others, we can't but pray for them. It's just the way it is. I mean, God doesn't wait for anybody to act, and yet he rejoices when we pray for our brethren. And he does work with our free will and he does respond. And it's a mystery. And you have to live that mystery. And the saints live that mystery. And you can't easily explain all these things with, you know, academic theology. We pray for those who've gone to their repose, who left this world, we pray for them and we have experiences through the lives of the saints that their lot, their situation, their stance changes even after death. There is no repentance in Hades, but there's love, love of the brethren for those souls. And the church's experience is that that matters. It changes things. 
not because the person had the ability to change because he doesn't but because through our love and god's love things change for them it's a gift that god gives to them so i can't explain it it's not some dogmatic you know book somewhere that i can point to here's it is the experience of the saints and the experience of contemporary elders that point us in this direction and you know if you're if you're not orthodox you don't have experience with the orthodox church and the saints in the orthodox church then you you probably might just you know sit there and say well this is a, how can i trust uh, how can i know what is? that's fine you know i don't expect you to embrace it but that's the reality of the saints we follow the saints go to the saints run to their lives run to their example read their lives and then you will begin to understand what the Orthodox Church is about. Until we encounter the saints, and that goes for everybody, whether you're baptized and in the church, or whether you're in a catechumen, or whether you're in choir, or whether you're a cynic, or whether you're whatever you are, if you want to know what Orthodox is about, go to the saints. Read the contemporary saints' lives, and then you'll begin to understand what Orthodox is. That's how we learn what it means to be an Orthodox Christian, because they're Christ in our midst. They're Christ, not, they don't live, but Christ lives in them, and he teaches us through them in our day. And he, give, he has given them for our salvation in this day, to be guided to him. And this is the beauty of the communion of the church, that in every age there are those who are God-pleasing, and they can lead us, and we can imitate them and be God-pleasing as well. Are toll houses an orthodox teaching? Uh, well, I would say it depends what you mean by toll houses. Uh, the book uh, on the subject that you need to read is from the St. Anthony's Monastery, and it's about a thousand page defense or presentation of the patristic teaching uh, on the whole question of the soul and its ascent uh, after its departure from the body and what happens. According to the patristic teachings, the the spirit, the various ascetic literature that we have, uh, that's what I would recommend uh, that you read to understand that. I listened to lectures of your guest, Arhi Monachos Sabas on Eurethis, and he's very much says say set they're real. Yes, well, so are most everybody I know in the <laughs> in the church. Uh, the people who really don't like that teaching and reject it are pretty small and they're they're usually academic theologians who don't have any experience of the ascetic life and don't trust the ascetic ascetics very much maybe sometimes there are a few others but not many usually that's the person who stands and doubts all that but that book is phenomenal read that i mean it's got icons and it's got history it's got tons of witnesses to this this is the experience of the ascetics the saints for for Thousand two hundred two thousand years really it goes back to the desert fathers. Uh, if someone uh, Richard Fernandez, if someone is to visit the Holy Mountain, which monastery would you recommend they request a blessing to stay at? I currently attend a monastery under Elder Ephraim uh, monthly. Okay, that's very good. Well, you know, I I would say that there's a several that have connected to the monasteries in America. And that's a good place to start because they've got they've got a lot of people who visit them. They have a lot of experience with people coming from America, and they'll understand you. They have people who speak English, so it's just a good place to start. Would be Filoteo, Caracalu, uh, Sierra Botamo, Consumenito. Uh, I, I also recommend people go to Gregorio or Saint Paul's. Those are some of the monasteries that I would recommend. But they're all there. There are many. Um, uh, wonderful monasteries and Kelia, uh, maybe also the monastery of Zografu. Fathers are very good there. Beautiful fathers there. I love them. Uh, yeah, I, that, that would probably be the best place for an American because of the connection. Uh, you know, there's St. Paul's and Gregory Dio. There's a lot of English speakers and those are all very sound Athenite monasteries. Uh, next question. If God uses demonic affliction and evil for good, why is it that some people are led to repentance while others become murderers? Well, it's called free will. People have free will. They choose. There's, a, there's an interplay of God's will and providence, people's free will, and the demonic 
pressures and, and attempts. And depending on our response, depending on our embrace uh, of God's will, uh, the demons flee or they remain. I mean, it depends on us um, and what we want. So, demonic affliction and evil for good. Now he tra he doesn't he, he transforms it for those who love him. So the presupposition there is that we love him, and then through our patience and our obedience and our long suffering, those things are all transformed into positive spiritual betterment for us, right? Just like just like you saw in the lives of all the saints and the those who were persecuted, persecution oftentimes gives birth to more the church that you know you know the famous saying the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church so uh no matter what the devils and the world does to the christian if they're faithful to christ it always comes out to their benefit that's what that means uh if you're not faithful you don't embrace christ and you have demonic affliction and you have followed the, the suggestions of the, demon, the demons well you've chosen your path and that's that's you know not, god does not do that but we do it we choose I think one of the last questions for tonight, uh, uh, St. Zervaco said the Greek nation, the new chosen people who use them as instruments of his divine revelations. Well, I got to know the context for that. What does he mean, the Greek nation? He's not talking about the leadership of the Greek people today who are apostates, um, you know, who, who uh, and including, you know, not a few clergy who are totally alienated from the Orthodox teaching. That's certainly not who he's talking about. So what does he mean there? Uh, but in any case, does he mean Orthodox that are Hellenized like you or Greeks? He's talking about Orthodox Christians. He's talking about the people who are faithful and also uh, are steeped in the uh, tradition of Romeo Sini. You know, when he means Greeks, he really means Romans. He means the people who are Orthodox and who speak Greek and who, who follow the Greek. He's not talking about Hellenized Greeks. Uh, Helena, uh, people who are following the Hellenic tradition per se, because you can be, you can be a Greek today and be an apostate. That's not who he's talking about. All right, so it's a very particular identity that he has in mind. Uh, and there are most Greeks today in public office, in public life, and social life, they're apostates. In other words, they're not faithful to, to orthodoxy. They're not apostates formally. But they're not, they're, they have a distance from the Orthodox faith, and that's what I mean by apostate. Apostate means they have a distance, right? They've fallen away from the narrow path. They're not living the Orthodox life. And that's a tragedy. And, and anybody in any Orthodox church father today or bishop or elder will tell you that the contemporary situation in Greece among many Greek people is a tragedy. You know, look at, look at what's happening right now in, in terms of leadership, in terms of church leadership. It's a tragedy. What's happening? We're in a terrible period. So, Elder Savakos, Elder Philotheus, rather, uh, you know, is talking about the old, faithful, Orthodox Romi. That's who he has in mind. Another question, Hannah Ligan. I think we got to stop the questions because we're, we're going on two hours and thirty-seven minutes. We're going to stop with these. Don't. No more questions, Timothy. Uh, for tonight, uh, do unbaptized infants, unborn babies go to paradise? Well, that's up to God. I don't know. That's I don't think there's a dogmatic ruling on that. They the, they could. I don't know. It, it, baptism is, of course, the catechrivia required into the kingdom of God. But if they're deprived of the baptism, they had no possibility of being baptized then the Lord can respond as he wills, like he did with the thief on the cross. I'm not to judge that. I don't know. That's God's ruling. Uh, so St. Paris just had a dream where aborted babies were being tormented and heard their screams. Yes, but does that mean that they were in hell? I don't know. I wouldn't interpret. I, I know the dream you're talking about. I wouldn't interpret that as meaning they're in hell. I think that had, I don't know. Like I might be wrong on this, so you know, take it a grain of salt. But I don't, I don't, I didn't see that dream as they're in all in hell because I that seems like a jump. It could mean that this is this terrible sin of abortion and what it does, and the murder that it that it represents, and the, the and the spiritual impact that it has on the world and all the rest. I don't know. 
I don't know if anybody's interpreted that. I don't have the last word on that. So question mark after that, as far as I'm concerned. I don't know. Why did we get chosen? Why do we get to choose where we are? And what does that imply since the victory in Christ has been declared? Hmm. Okay. Victory in Christ is for those who choose Christ and participate in Christ and follow Christ. We can choose to follow him or choose not to follow him. Right? So does that answer your question? I'm not really sure the question is kind of hard for me to what you're asking exactly. Why do we get to choose? Because that's we're in the image of God and God that gave us free will. I'm not sure that what does that mean? Uh, where are where are we? Where are we? Where we will be, you mean? Is that the question? You know, do we choose heaven or hell? What do you want to, what do you, what do you imply? What does that imply since the victory in Christ has been declared? So Christ gives the victory to everyone who's in him and follows him and is a part of his uh, body, right? That's, that's communion with him. And he, it's not uh, I, but Christ who lives in me. This is the victory that he gives to everyone who is his disciple. Um, if you and I turn away from that relationship, that communion, that obedience, we are not participating in his victory anymore, are we? Because we're not overcoming any longer the loss of communion. We're turning away from communion in God, and therefore that's that's alienation. That's not oneness with Christ. Uh, we got a whole bunch of questions over here at Crowdcast. Let's see if we can get a couple, and then we're going to call it a night. Okay, so that one's already been answered, Caesar. Uh, we got to that one. Uh, Nancy in Alberta. Our constant repentance must be connected to the constant sanctification. Yes. Could you speak to this? And if there's time, my question number two. Well, repentance is return. Repentance is reorientation. Repentance is a stance which seeks out Christ and communion. It's a return to God and communion with God. Sanctification is when we're in that and we remain in that. It's kind of what the elders said earlier, that there's victory in conversion and then there's victory in martyrdom, right? The one is to turn and to accept and embrace. The other is to remain in that. So holiness comes when we're in communion with God, not just a little bit, not just once in a while, but we remain in that. We go deeper and we go deeper and we, and we continue to grow in that, uh, and we're continually purified, and we're continually increasing the grace uh, by our, our, our faithfulness to remain in communion with God. Uh, question number two, I'm not trying to shirk the struggle, but where is the joy of the Lord if we're focused on struggle? Well, the struggle is a joy. The struggle is not a, oh, I got a struggle. Struggle is a joy because we, we love to be with our Lord. We love to sacrifice for the Lord. We love to struggle for him. That's what gives us joy. So it's they're not opposed. Joy is not pleasure. Joy is not laxity. Joy is not, you know, joy is knowing and being in communion with God. And, of course, that's going to be a struggle in this world of vanity, in this world that hates the gospel, in this world where the passions are constantly being thrown at us. It's a struggle to be in that joy to remain in that joy, right? But if you do struggle, you will have the joy. All right. Thank you, Nancy and Alberta. Hopefully that helps you, helps you on your way. Uh, Serafima, the book of Revelation was one of the reasons why I fell from Christianity into following the New Age philosophies. Why? That's strange. Which promised the golden age of humanity. But the book of Revelation doesn't teach any of that. Fortunately, God revealed to me that the revelation is true prophecy. Glory to God. I repented for the New Age illusion. Glory to God. Yet I still get quite fearful of the end times. No, 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 no. We're already in the end times. Are you fearful? Are you fearful? Of, no, just rejoice. Be, be in God and rejoice that he's giving you the truth. He's, he's consoling you by telling you all this. You don't have to fear anything. I still study. I love studying the revelation, yet it gives me PTSD. <laughs> You need to study it with Elder Athanasios, not alone. Do not sit and study it alone. Do not do that. Not a good idea. You study it at the feet of the saints and the elders. At least get St. Andrew of Caesarea as your guide. 
at least that. Elder Athanasius is much better because, not because he's better than the saint, but because he's in our day and he explains it for us better. We need his, his guidance. So, yes, we all make mistakes, said Afima. It's all behind you today. Live right now in the moment. Don't go back. Repent whenever it comes back to you. Seek and ask forgiveness and then immediately live in the moment. Uh, Amalia, of the Gita Father, my pastor just told us last Sunday, USA AB Archbishop has started the Sunday prostrations, claiming that Americans work all week and do not prostrate themselves during the week. So it's okay for Sunday divine liturgy. However, I need to improve on them. Thank you for a great lesson tonight. Okay, Amalia, ignore that. He's not, he has no business telling us to break the canons of the ecumenical councils. That's not his, it's not, he's not able to do that. Anybody who teaches you, if I started teaching you, ignore the ecumenical councils, ignore the boundaries of the church, go to a Protestant church, oh, and then go to the Orthodox church, or it doesn't matter if you're homosexual, if it doesn't matter. If I started teaching you, if anybody starts teaching you any of that, ignore them, flee from them, and ignore them. Okay. Anybody who teaches you another gospel, the Apostle Paul is clear. If an angel came down from heaven and taught you that which is not taught by me, he says to his disciples, anathema, anathema. Okay, so if they're teaching something different, ignore what they're teaching you and look to the saints and turn away from them. Doesn't mean you have to run into another jurisdiction. Doesn't mean you have to leave the church and do wall yourself off. That's not what I'm not implying that. I'm saying the particular teaching and what they're saying needs to be ignored. Caesar gives us a, rem a reminder from the conference of what Father Felipe said about a certain priest. I hope people persecute you more. Yeah, well, there you go. I think that's, uh, I think Caesar, you you got the message. You, you understood what he's talking about. Here it is. We talked about it tonight. If you're not persecuted for Christ, something's wrong. There you go. So I don't know. Let's hope that the persecution is it's not too much too fast. We, we can deal with it. How does one avoid the temptation of despondency during long stretches in the desert between monastery visits? Um, maybe I should answer like Father Meredith. Thank you very much for your question. Should we? Can we remind everybody who you were at the conference, Meredith? Should we remind everybody what Father Josiah said? Just suck it up, right? Do violence, you know. Double down. Go deeper and double down, and just and just fight. Uh, there's no easy answer there, but I would say there's a lot of helps that can help you, right? When I when I have a, a just a moment where uh, I don't know there's a little deadness, of, you know, I, I usually put on chanting the particular chanting that I love from Mount Athos by uh, Father Damaskinos on uh, the doxology. Uh, but you know, there's all these little things that help us to just uh, refocus, kind of reorient again, uh, and rejoice in the Lord. Uh, so you got to use all those tricks, but I think mainly it's you with, we have to start realizing brothers and sisters is that the violent take the kingdom of heaven by force. There's no way around it. Double down, go do a prostrations, go say the Jesus prayer, pick up the book and read the lives of the saints, pick up the scriptures, go, uh, listen to a, you know, again, to something you really helped you before go read a portion, go listen to a lecture that was really helpful. Don't, remain idle don't sit there and wall don't sit there and say oh me i'm so i'm alone there's nobody to none of that right you have to be a violent struggler and that person is led quickly to spiritual peace and the harbor of spiritual peace no matter who and where he is next question and last one for the night just a quick trivial question oh trivia uh, why does the uncommon press refer to being founded in the year 7509 that's thank you very much well that is actually the appropriate uh the approximate we believe year from the uh beginning of creation that's the year that they used to that's how they used to date things for many 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 uh generations and many centuries um uh, so there you go god bless you good to, good to have you good to be with you uh pray for us we'll see you on thursday all of our crowdcasters we'll be back on thursday and uh, next Tuesday again. Uh, sorry, we're a little behind in terms of covering the text. It is uh, what it is. And I'm sorry I'm not getting to the PDFs that I used to be able to get to, but 
we have since the conference i'm telling you we have ugh, i've never never thought we'd have so much work and there's so many people involved right now so i have to cut somewhere and uh, unfortunately the pdfs have been cut out because they take me about twice or three times as long to prepare for this course every time i do a pdf so it is what it is i hope i can continue i hope i can come back and offer you the pdfs again but the work is so much more. I mean, this launching the orthodoxethos.com page is hopefully, I mean, it's a big mountain. We're getting up and hopefully we'll get over to the other side and we'll get back to normal. But we've got all these books. We've got more books that we're working on that we want to get out in the next few months. We've got another conference coming up. So uh, it is what it is. I hope that, uh, you know, you'll forgive me uh, and hope hopefully these lectures are still very beneficial for everybody. And we're still making progress uh, deeper into the wisdom of the text and the, and the Holy Fathers. God bless you. Have a good evening. And we'll chant the Traparian to our Lord, uh, the Holy Cross, the uh, Traparian to the Holy Cross. So, son, kiri et on la on su, kev longi son, din su. Nikas di vasi lemsi, canta var varon dorumenos, que ton son filanton, dian tu stavrusu politevman. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us and save us. Adeo de fe, 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 fe